I'm a bodybuilder here, man. We need all the four, camera. all the four K cameras are on you. I think, uh, uh, you know, the camera adds 10 pounds, and so we're just trying to be okay. nice to you so okay, it doesn't thanks. make you look too fat. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> I had so you're not pounds. actually lifting right now? Are you just doing mostly cardio? I don't, I don't work out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I try to work out, but there's just, you no know, time. it's just so pathetic compared to, you know, what I, what I was used to for a long That's time. That's pretty much what I feel like right now. <laughs> Usually like 20 minutes of cardio. In the right. morning, and Kegels, that's Kegels and butt clenches, and, and that's go, man. pretty much it. He, is that all you do? How does he know yeah. about our workout? <laughs> ah, that's part of our workout. That's part of the Bell <laughs> program, yeah. part of our system. That and Cheerios, right? That's all you need. <laughs> how's it? How's it feel being? Uh, you're retired from bodybuilding. Retired from professional bodybuilding, right? Mm -hmm. Retired from the stage. Retired from competing. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. How's that feel? Uh, it's a relief, man. Because as you know, man, to be to be the best in the world than anything it's completely all-encompassing and selfish so it's been a great yeah yeah it's been a great um load off my back to be able to spend time with my family to be able to focus he said on load he load. write that down yeah. or keep couch. Track. <laughs> Get on the couch. casting couch <laughs> um how long did it take you to get that pro card like how long was that like in your sights for um truthfully like i've been aspiring to to get bigger from the time i was 15 years old um didn't compete until after university so i got a four-year degree um and then just wanted to get in shape because i was fat and got in shape and won shows and kept winning shows and then got my pro card from the time i started competing to the time i got my card was two and a half years you were fat in college so uh, that's kind of rare for a bodybuilder right like most pro bodybuilders aren't fat are they i grew, I grew up they're fat. usually thin right yeah so i grew up as a fat kid man everyone in my family's overweight now fat, fat kid or just kind of fat no nah. pudgy Depends what you do. Fat. I, I'd say I was pretty fat, man. How much did you weigh? I don't know, I, but I was probably twenty five percent body fat. Oh, okay. That's pretty rare. Normally, a lot of bodybuilders, and we know professional. Yeah, bodybuilders, most people come they usually from don't ever really accumulate a lot of fat. They usually come from being skinny, which makes it easier for them to stay lean. Right. So, did you ever have a problem with like staying real lean? Because you were one um, of the leaner guys. I, I got shredded for contest, man, but I struggled for every minute of that shit. Like I, I was. I was the guy who was crushing every. I had to do. I had, you can't I had to kill be the fat kid. <laughs> yeah. You also had so much muscle on you that it right. was kind of insane. What was hey, your? Uh, hey, settle down over there. What, <laughs> what was your weight? I know he's at? an attractive man, but Jesus Christ. What was your weight at when we'll you were? Snuggle later, boys. Um, there we go. My weight for contest heaviest ever was two eighty three, two eighty four, maybe. Wow, in a contest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Holy shit! Yeah. yeah, that's a lot of muscle to be carrying. How tall are you? Five ten. Yeah, five ten, two eighty three. Mm -hmm. Boom. Bodybuilders they always throw a couple extra inches on everything, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can I? Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> can, I, can I get a hey now? Uh, did you have to do a lot of cardio? I did, um, especially younger, like uh, uh, ignorant, like most people, just did a lot of cardio, thinking it's the best mm -hmm. method for losing fat. And didn't know any better, but um, I did, man. I mean, for most contests, I was doing two hours of cardio a day. Uh, especially early in my career, toward the end of my career, I stopped doing cardio pretty much altogether because I learned how to train. I learned how to manipulate right. training. And like if you were to train a bodybuilder today, you know, like a new up and coming bodybuilder, you wouldn't have him doing two two hours of cardio a day. That's no, not what it takes no to chance, be. No chance. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not against cardio, man. I don't think cardio is a bad thing, but I think it's misused and, and misunderstood. So, um, you know, cardio is not your best opportunity to burn fat. Card the only time cardio becomes your best opportunity to burn fat is if you're in a really low carb state, if you're in a really depleted state. And you know, low intensity cardio becomes your best opportunity to burn fat. But if you're eating high carbohydrate, like most bodybuilders, high intensity exercise. Are things changing in the bodybuilding world as far as this goes? This like the the diet and the training and stuff are are things. Well, I, I certainly hope so. Evolving, I, I, like I, like everything in life, it should be evolving. I certainly mm -hmm. hope it's evolving. If we're doing the same shit they did in the '70s, we're you know stupid. What are some of the kind of things that you you guys used to do that maybe you don't do anymore? Like. Is it, is a six meals a day out the window? Is that still a thing, or like what? You know, what I think that's necessary for some bodybuilders just to get the sheer number of calories we need, right? Like when I was yeah. when I was off season, I was eating you know upwards of seven thousand calories a day. Like you're not getting that in at three meals, right? Mm -hmm. So um, just spreading it out, right? You, you're trying to give your body a chance. What's, to what's that travel. like eating like that all the time? It's terrible, man. <laughs> it's it's the worst thing ever, and especially when it's good clean food, right? Like if I if I eat junky food, I get yeah. fat, so I always have to eat clean food. Um, it's terrible, man. Like but you don't have an opportunity to even like 
in a lot of cases, you don't even have an opportunity to use like teriyaki sauce and stuff like like it's just chicken, rice, broccoli, kind of over and over again. You can't really yep. put much on it, right? Maybe mustard or something. Uh, I, don't I, even, I, was, I don't even know. I was doing mustard, yeah, for sure. I did mustard. Yeah. I, sometimes you do ketchup, but. Uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty plain. Ketchup. I got addicted Ooh. to sea salt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're getting a little frisky it's around hardcore, here. Yeah. Ketchup, hardcore. Yeah, that sea salt, toast, corn syrup. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bleeding into the no, diet. no, no. Come on, man. I'm doing the organic one. You got to know better than that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> organic, that. organic ketchup. There you go. That's right. Yeah, no, no corn syrup for this guy. That's that's uh, a crazy amount of discipline. I'm. I've heard uh, Jay Cutler. You know, he's just like I hated every meal he's like i normally would like to eat like two or three times a day and uh you know the day i retired that's what i did and i've been doing that's that ever do since and he's that's like literally what I do. Yeah, yeah. he said he feels a, he feels a lot a big better. thing with bodybuilding is um a lot of times we see people come out of it really unhealthy uh really damaged um worse for wear uh yeah. you look pretty damn good you look that's like, uh, mainly because of the how old for pay right yeah, yeah. i mean maybe no, that's a different right. podcast but uh how how old are you and how do you maintain your boyish looks here man i'm 36 and i just made sure i got out that's why i got out right because i knew for me to go to that next level if i wanted to be top five in the olympia it was another level for me uh it was another level of commitment it was another five years of you know really committing and going hard and um I was just happy to get out with my health, man. Cause, I mean, inevitably at some point it's going to catch up with you, right? Even just walking around at 300 pounds all the time is going to catch up with you. So uh, luckily, completely got away with my health, minimal injuries, aches and pains and bumps and bruises mm -hmm. like everybody. But um, yeah, man, I feel awesome. One thing I love about bodybuilding, and I think it could be applied to life and it could be applied to any other sport, is the 24-hour discipline that it takes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's one of the few sports, I mean, uh, if you're trying to be professional and you're trying to be the best, then it totally makes sense to jump all in and to be to be in 100% and to, you know, devote, to, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to your craft. But, I mean, let's kind of face it, most sports don't really do that. Right. And, and also... Uh, it, you know, you can also kind of say like genetically, and there's a lot of other factors that, that kind of get in there, but, um, it doesn't seem to matter that much in other sports, but on bodybuilding where you're getting judged on stage where every little thing matters, whether you have, uh, your arms are a certain size or whether you, you know, stripped all the body fat down in all the right spots, uh, you have no choice right. for it to be a 24 seven so discipline. The way that I explain it to people is in sports and athletics, it's an external focus, right? My, my objective is I need to run faster. I need to jump higher. I need to score more goals. Bodybuilding, it's all internal. So you need to manage every one of your internal uh, systems, your internal state and in every one of these systems. So you have to pay attention to everything. Otherwise, you have no control over it. And, and bodybuilders, unfortunately, a lot of us are still focused on the external. How much do I lift? How hard did I work today? All this stuff is, it, is only irrelevant. And it only matters in as much as it's creating this internal response that I'm looking to, to achieve. Is it creating the muscle building response? Is it creating the fast loss response, fat loss response inside my body? And that's the separation that bodybuilders have to start making is like, all these things that happen outside of our body are only matter if they're creating the exact internal response that I'm after. Are are most bodybuilders? Uh, it's a weird question in some way. Are most bodybuilders kind of boring, like by nature, because of the because of the structure that it takes? Absolutely, man. It has to be right. Like, what do we do? Eat, sleep, and drain. And unfortunately, that's just the reality of it. Yeah. And that's one of the other reasons I'm so Can't grateful. Be out partying and being wild. Well, I'm people like, would always comment. I'm like, uh, I watch Ronnie Coleman's video, and right. there, there he is eating, and then he's like sleeping through like half his meal, yeah. and then he's lifting. He's and then the I, worst cop of all time. He's yeah. Like, Here I am eating chicken. <laughs> well, again. They're, they're like, like they're like, that's supposed to be working. <laughs> and people are like, that's all he does in his video. It's so boring. But they yeah. watch it a million times. Right. And they and they get into the routine of doing the same exact thing. Apparently, there's a Marcus Rule video where like he actually goes and they watch him on the toilet, like he's smoking a cigarette on the toilet. And I was like, that's that's literally like the most exciting thing a bodybuilder does yeah. in the day. Yeah, it's kinda, the bowel right? movement in the morning, right? Yeah, I think that that's yeah. like a, a a big thing. Is like a, a lot of people, a lot of people think it's boring and they, they wouldn't they they wouldn't want to uh, do that every day. But there's a lot of people that that do do it, you know. And they, right. well, we saw that with uh, John Cena when we first met <clears throat> John Cena. My brother and I. Uh, worked with John uh, at a company called Mass Movement, where we moved fitness equipment. One of the worst jobs of all time. Get killed every day. <laughs> and yeah. John was like, I mean, he 
was in amazing shape already, but he's like, I'm going to do a bodybuilding show. And, you know, he, at the time he was just doing what he thought was best. And so that was uh, chicken breast every other meal and whey protein uh, in in between. He yep. did that six. He also didn't have any money to like do it. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. So it was yeah, like he was, he partially was, financial. Right. Yeah, he was just scraping together whatever he, whatever he had. And I was just thinking to myself, there's no way this guy's going to do that fucking diet. What's he talking about? He's going to do that six times a day and he's going to do it for the next three weeks. I'm like, there's no way. And sure enough, he just does it. And uh, he did his bodybuilding show and he's completely shredded and leaned out and everything. And that's when I realized, I'm like, okay, well, first of all, don't ever doubt this guy again. And yeah. secondly, uh, anything that he wants to do, he's going to be able to accomplish. Yeah. And I think everybody has everybody lived that part of their life at some point, right? It's like no money and like figuring out some way to just achieve this end result, man. We all have this, this objective. I want Expired protein by himself living, <laughs> living on expired protein. He had this giant bucket. <laughs> it was like a six pound. He um, loved it. He loved when he's like, bucket. Oh, yeah. And it wasn't even now. optimum nutrition. It was something like cheaper at the time, like a yeah. cheaper brand than not even. And it was like, I don't know, this big bucket of like a Metrex wannabe. It yes. wasn't Metrex, but it was a fave <laughs> Metrex. And he, he would have that six times a day and did that for until the bucket was empty, you know, and then got another bucket of it because it was on sale because it was expired. We all lived there, man. Like, the, you, know? you know, the six to eight cans of tuna I did because they were 49 cents when sure. I was in you know high school and college. Like, that's that's what it was, yeah. man. I was very lucky, very young to be sponsored by Muscle Tech when I was 19. Wow. Wow. Um, they saw the calves, man. They saw the calves, and like yeah, calves are gigantic. So I, honestly, all through college, I literally lived. I don't know if you guys remember the Mesotech bars, yeah, man, yeah. Dude, I, I, had, I had a closet full of those things. I had that Nitro Tech and Cell Tech, and I literally like that was my caloric sustenance through all through college, man. Yeah. That's it, and that's how I got through. And I traded it. Well, stuff tasted good. Yeah. So if I needed something, I would trade it with my buddies. I'm like, yeah, I need some of this, like you know. That, that's yeah, I remember that the trading used to go on like crazy because <laughs> a lot of my friends were sponsored by different companies. Yeah. We'd actually bring it into the supplement store and trade it into them. Yeah. And they'd oh, yeah. resell it and yep. give us some supplements for free. And then also take us, started getting smart and they put stickers on it, like, you know, supplement product yeah, or yeah. athlete product, not for resale. Yeah, we'd sell exactly. it and always take the sticker off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we had all, all of our friends were sponsored. We, like, that's how we'd figure out how to get our supplements was yeah. trading them out with people. Yeah. When it comes to, like, protein bars and stuff, there's, there's really, when you're a professional bodybuilder, there's really absolutely no room for anything like that, right? Never, no. I, I mean, especially for myself, like you guys say, the reason I was able to maintain such health is that I pay attention to everything that goes into my body. So, you know, there's no artificial flavors, no artificial sweeteners. I'm kind of, I'm kind of methodical like that. Uh, and even during the career, man, I, I definitively noticed a difference when I ate crap. So, so you're like, not oh. like a crystal light guy. Like sometimes some of these guys, instead yeah. of the water, they're drinking Throughout, like throughout my career, there was points where, you know, in, during a contest prep, you're so, you're going to either go crazy or have a little crystal light, in which yeah, case gotcha. it's fine, especially early in my career. But later on, man, it's just, if it's not making me better, I'm not putting it in. Right. I was so committed <laughs> to that end result. Yeah, that's it. It's a, it's a, it's a smart mindset. It seems like everyone should have that mindset. Um, this um, kind of mind muscle connection, is this something that you got into later uh, after you retired yeah, or is it, no, or I mean, is it something a, that you were practicing? There's a story behind it. So, um, you know, I got my pro card in 2008, did the 2009 Tampa pro and got third, did very well relative, um, you know, Dennis James won the show and he was one of my idols growing up. And then 2000 um, after that. So I wanted to prep for the New York pro cause I thought that was a great show. Um, so I had eight months to prep for the show and I literally committed everything in my life. Like I, I turned my cell phone off. I trained t twice a day. All I did was eat, sleep and train. <clears throat> Going to that New York pro, I was shredded. I was 17 pounds heavier on stage. Uh, and I was so confident yeah, I was going to do well. Difference. So I was, yeah, 267 on stage and I got crushed. I got fucked, just destroyed. I got seventh place and I got beat by s some guys that I would say, you know, are shitty bodybuilders. Mm -hmm. And I was pissed. It's all politics, man. Right. And, that, and that's exactly the first thing that came out of my mouth. Is yeah, I was yeah. like, screw this. You know, I'm Canadian, so they're trying to screw me. Uh, <laughs> or, or it's just politics. And then, you know, it was two weeks. Fucking and, Canada. And I was literally going to retire. Fucking Canada. Yeah. Um, and then I was going to retire. I was like, fuck this. I don't want to deal with this bullshit, the politics. And there's two weeks. I went, I went off the show. I took my girl to Mexico and spent some time in Mexico. Came back. Didn't look at any pictures. When I finally got back, I looked at the pictures. And I was like, fuck, I look like shit. Um, so at that point, I was like, what, so what, you know, kind of looked at it objectively and I said, what is it that I did that I didn't like? So my strengths got really, really strong. So my legs and my shoulders got really, really big and my back and my arms got small and my proportions were weird. So at that point, I, started, I made the realization that if you can build any muscle, you can build them all. Like, so people, people attach to this idea of like, mm -hmm. oh, you have genetically strong and genetically weak body parts is bullshit. You have different shape. But if you can build one body part, you can build them all. It's all the same internal chemistry. You just have to learn to direct tension there. So the difference is some body parts, your your body will naturally put tension through really easily when you train. Some body parts, it won't. So at that point, it was kind of the catalyst for me going, well, how do I start manipulating this stuff? So I had a biomechanics degree. 
prior to that, so I'd studied it a lot. But uh, at that point, from I was Canada like, though, from Canada, which yeah, okay. obviously let's that's, not, that's that's void. Yeah, let's not try to make it something it's not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. So that, that's what happened for me, man. It's just like me realizing that I, I, I'm doing so great building these other body parts. Why can't I build these these other ones? So, and that's how the calves exploded. No, the calves exploded <laughs> at, at the beginning. So when I was 16 years old, I saw a picture of Dorian Yates in a magazine, and I was like. I just want that. So I literally train them every day for five years. Every Remember single those pictures day. of Dorian in Flex Magazine? Those, yeah. Is black that the and ones? Whites, black yeah. and whites, yeah. People Bananas. at Gold's Gym. I literally cut them out and pasted them on the wall. People at Gold's calves. Gym, Venice, would yeah. talk about your calves. They were like stuff of legends. Right. They were like the legendary. They were, big, they were big at some point, man. I was so. How big were they? I was almost 23 inches at one point. Holy shit. Yeah. Some bowling balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's huge. Yeah. I think my calves are like 17 and a half right. or something. People always tell me I have huge calves. So right. There's some pictures from the New York Pro from actually Musco Crazy. Development Magazine. Like Jesus. Pair of Bernal. Um, yeah, I got nothing compared to that. So Holy there's shit. like, yeah, there's like that striations. Photo shoot, the one on the there. right where I've got a gray tank top and a hat backwards. Pull that one up. I'm the, up to the top on the right. Right at the top right, oh, right in the corner. Here. You're really messing things up over there, yeah. Andrew. Well, it's hard because I can't see both screens. Oh, yeah, like, come right. on. We don't want to hear excuses. So, we yeah, just there, want to see. A, I'm wearing uh, Vibram 5 figure shoes. <coughs> you know what those are. So that's where my calves would have been the biggest, at least in contest. Yeah, off, right. off season, they probably would have been nice and swollen. You play but, sports growing up? Is yeah, that kind of what oh, would damn. lead to the calves being, uh, being you know, uh, genetic? Calf off. Or not being genetic, but just being kind of prepped to be big in the first place? Did you play a lot of sports? I did, yeah, man. I played everything. I played hockey. I played baseball. Football, just running ball. around, being on your toes, and maybe the way you walk along with a yeah. lot of heavy lifting sure. and, and hard training. literally training. like every single day for five years, right? I did every workout, every, you know, high reps, low reps. Yeah, that's crazy. When yeah. you were young, were you strong? Weak as a fucking kitten, man. Yeah. I, I, dude, I, this is no joke. I remember celebrating curling the 12 and a half pound dumbbells <laughs> when I was 17 years old. Like that was a big accomplishment. I just celebrated for me. that yesterday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was big. a big accomplishment for me. I was so weak, man. So the, the funny story about my my beginning was uh, I started as a vegetarian and a long distance runner. Um, and I, the reason I became a you know, dude, <laughs> I'm, I'm, right there with you, I'm just kidding. The reason I became a vegetarian was because I believed meat was bad, which is a co funny conversation to have with you guys. This now. is before you got into body. I knew nothing, man. I was 14 years old. Somebody told me meat was bad, so my my solution was I'm going to eat muffins and bagels. Because that's going to be healthy for me. Because yeah, I whole grain. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. Where are your parents at this point? <laughs> They're not concerned. <laughs> They're Canadian. I don't know. No, man. I, my my parents were never really around to influence anything I did. So I, gotcha. I, I was kind of a lone wolf, and that, that's probably why I chose bodybuilding was, you know, the independence of it. Mm. Just it's me and nobody else. Yeah. So that's a big reason a lot of people choose bodybuilding. Completely. Yeah. It's like them, they feel like I it's them against the world. Sports. I sucked at team sports. I, I was always a great athlete. I was always the captain of the team, but not because I was a leader, but because I was the best. Um. So. I was just like, sit the fuck down, I'll do it myself. I was that guy, right? And uh, that's why bodybuilding called me. <laughs> uh, were you angry when you were young? I was. I was an angry teenager, man. I, even all the way through, you know, my early... There's a lot of people that kind of like lift angry. Like, uh, yeah. you know, my brother and I have been going to Gold's Gym, uh, Venice, for years um and uh we see the guys with the headphones on and they they kind of you know get the mean mean mug it a little bit and they're right. they're focused like totally understandable yeah, everyone's going to train different and uh you know i don't expect everybody to be like dicking around and joking around the whole mm -hmm. time especially uh if it's your profession uh but what have you kind of learned from that having that mindset uh, in the beginning to kind yeah, of where you ask trans... question man so you know as a kid you, you model people, right? So you see these bodybuilders and all of them are like, you got to be focused, you got to be angry, you want, you want to use your fuel, you, you yeah. know, use anger as fuel. I think that's the worst thing people can do, man, because every time you train, you got to realize like, you know, if you walk into a, you know, an ex-girlfriend's house or if you walk into the police station, if you walk into whatever, man, you, your brain remembers those scenarios mm -hmm. and, and the stress response, whether it's a stress response or a happy response is always going to be the same. So if you're, every time you walk into the gym, if you're, if you're constantly indoctrinating that like angry, 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 every time you lift, every time you contract that muscle, your brain's remembering anger and fear and resentment and all these, these things. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing you can do for your, your psychology is keep ingraining that into your nervous yeah. system so i uh, mean i started that way for sure and uh you know i'm so grateful that at some point i realized like why the hell am i doing this because i hated <laughs> it man like and you can imagine yeah. as a pro bodybuilder how much i attached to every single workout needed to be world class or i was a failure um it was hard man it was a hard thing to to learn but i definitely did toward the end of my career learn to love the process and that's probably why but leaving bodybuilding was such a great thing for me was um i didn't have to i didn't have to be that anymore i could learn to love it again it's a vicious cycle because you end up 
you end up going to the gym, you have the specific focus, and uh, it's almost like you it's almost like you're searching for something to throw you off and make you even more angry. Yes. And uh, yes. then it throws you out of your, uh, throws you out of your routine of what you wanted to do. Like if you had a specific exercise you mm -hmm. wanted to do, uh, you've already, and, you've yeah. already planned it out that somebody's mm -hmm. in your way. They're not really in your way. Right. They're not right. actually in your way. You could right. go do something else. You could right. warm up. You could be productive somewhere else. There's tons of other shit you can do in the gym. Right. Uh, but you kind of like made up your mind that this motherfucker is in my way today and I'm going to storm back and forth and yeah. I'm going to be all grumpy. Man, I hated the gym <laughs> so much for the last few years of my career that I would literally sit in my car for 15 minutes before I went in the gym to try to get my brain right to, to go in there. Right. Like, I fucking hated it, man. And I built that into my into my nervous system to the point where it's just... You know, I, I couldn't. It couldn't be any other way. I had so Maybe much stress. Maybe that's what Paul was doing. Maybe he wasn't yeah. waiting for a spot. Maybe he was. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I think though. Like I, I've gotten like that too, where I've gotten to the point where um, I've just gotten sick of the environment of the gym, and I don't know yeah. why I didn't want to go in. But there was times where I did the same thing. Like right. just sit out there waiting, going like, I know I got to go in there and get stuff done, right. but I just don't feel like it. Or so, man, this is why what I'm trying to do now is a complete shift. Is I'm trying to empower people, and a lot of people hate the gym because they feel like they don't have the ability to get results. A lot of people go. I don't have the genetics it's fucking bullshit man you just haven't you don't have the skill set like if i say hey man we're gonna we're gonna bake a world-class cake right we want to build bake mm. the be best cake in the world hmm. there um, we go. anybody can bake a cake if yep. all you got to do is go to the baker and go say hey man give me the recipe for the world-class cake everybody can build a world-class body you may not be a, a mr olympia competitor <clears throat> you may not be a fitness model but you can build a world-class body you just gotta have this you gotta have the the skill set you got to have the process right and that's really all it's about is that's what i'm trying to empower people with is realize like all your excuses around time around genetics around nutrition is fucking bullshit let's just learn how to do it for your body and and yeah. you know I, i've i've struggled more than anybody to build my body you guys like you're hearing my struggles man as a kid i was fat I, everyone in my family was lazy and alcoholic never been never graduated high school even, right um so realizing that everyone's excuses are bullshit um, just learn the learn the system, man. It's it's really and put in the time, you know. Yeah, that's of course. A, a bigger... but, but wouldn't it? Don't you feel like everybody likes the things, or they want to do the things that they like, or they're, they're good yeah. at, right? So when you have a skill set and you actually feel like you're getting results, like fuck, I want to go more. I love this, and that's what we're trying to do is empower people with that. Yeah, it sucks doing things that you're not good at. Like nobody, nobody to, yeah. If nobody you're not getting results, them. you're like fuck this, man. <laughs> my, you know, my my joints hurt. I don't want to. I don't want to go do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna be sore tomorrow. Like. It's just because you're doing the wrong thing. Yeah, you just keep hitting the wall every day, and yeah. it should be uh, progress every day. Right. You know, yeah. rather than my pecs growing, my shoulders are sore. Who's going to want to go back and do that again? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Fuck that. Whereas if we just make some slight changes, oh, now I actually. Feel How do you great figure out this. ways around that? How do you help people um, stay healthy and not get injured and stuff? Not attaching to watching what other people do. The worst thing we can do, man, is like, hey, go watch me on the internet or go watch somebody else on the internet. Exercise is the stupidest thing you can mm -hmm. do. We're not built the same, man. We all we all fit into exercise differently. We all need exercises that are built for our body. And that, that's the worst thing we can do, man, is watching these other pros and going, oh, you know, Ben has great legs. And he squats, therefore I should squat too. It's just not the, not the truth, man. Like, we have to come up with different things that work for our body. And, and that's hopefully what we'll go through later today is just looking at what your body what needs to do to, to accomplish the goal you're after, right? Is it muscle building? Is it strength? Is it whatever? Is it specific to specific development of one body part? Well, let's develop that. Don't yeah. be attached to how you do it. Don't be attached to squatting and deadlifting and, and rows, whatever. Like I think you're right because when you get attached to like how you do it, or like the specifics of it, then you're locked into that and you have no right. other no other options. Well, and then if, if I say, hey, I want to I want to squat, your body goes, okay, I'm going to squat and go all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top. But what muscles are being challenged the most? And, and the reality is, we can manipulate what muscles are being challenged the most in any exercise by learning how to set up differently for our body. Yeah, I mean, there might be one person that, um, and, and I've talked about this many times with powerlifting, there's some people that can squat really efficiently. Mm -hmm. And I've actually seen you squat, you squat super efficiently. So therefore, it would immediately what I immediately think of in terms of, of strength athlete, uh, well, here's somebody that can handle probably more volume and more frequency exactly. yep. because you're going to recover from it because you're not squatting like a retard. Right. You're not leaning real far forward and, and you're not getting into these positions where you're dumping all the weight into your lower back. It's actually on the muscles that are supposed to be working. Sure. And uh, there's a lot more options. You know, so yep. with each person, there's going to be specific uh, movements. I've heard you talk about this before, and it's something that uh, power lifters use quite often. There's going to be certain moves for certain people that uh, that they need to address and they need to work on more than others. And there's going to be certain exercises that are that really fit perfectly mm -hmm. into some somebody's body type. And even just manipulations of, of different exercises like 
you know, doing <clears throat> different, doing squat differently, like different, different widths. What, like people attach to, I'm going to do a sumo because Dan Green does sumo or, you know, <laughs> right. no, man, let's figure out what works for your body. Some legs. Yeah. Dan's a freak, but <laughs> uh, you know, not <laughs> attaching to, to watching other athletes and going, Oh, I, I want to do what he does. Like, no, I, I need to do what works for my body. Otherwise you're going to break. If right. you, if you want to be great at something or even good at something, you got to do what works for you. Otherwise you're going to break, you know, like bench pressing. Some people are great bench pressers. And so, whereas some people, most people, you know, if I say, how do you work your upper chest? Most people go, well, you do an incline bench press. Hmm. At least 80% of people will not be using their upper chest in an incline bench press. They'll be using the front delts. Whereas they actually will use more upper chest on a flat bench press, which gotcha. is so ridiculous. And I'll show you guys that later today, but right. it's, it's such simple stuff, man. Rather than being attached to, oh, an incline bench press works my upper chest. Just fucking watch. Right. Just look, and and I'll show you how to do. That. It's very simple. Um, so and it's like, it's oh. possible, like if if he and I are lifting together, that if we're doing the same exercise, you're doing completely different. Yeah, bosses. you might have him doing yep. the bottom, you know, from the bottom up, and I might be doing it hitting a different range, just because we got different arm or lines. just a different angle. Yeah, just a completely something different. <clears throat> yeah, different you exercise. move the bench a tiny bit, right? Like you move it back, right. move so it forward. The best you know metaphor to think about is like, so let's say we're doing any exercise, we're doing a bench press. Your body's got five different um, muscles that can use this weight, and your body's going to disperse that weight according to its strongest body parts. Your brain's very smart. Obviously, it's meant for survival. It's going to disperse it according to whatever's strongest. Um, so what we're trying to do as someone who's trying to hypertrophy a muscle is we're trying to take away all the other muscles from assisting. So right. if I have five that can assist, but I want my pecs to do the greatest amount of work, I need to learn how to set up to take those other four muscle groups out of it as much as possible. So now my body sees the pec as the greatest solution rather than just arbitrarily going and lifting and letting my body use its strongest body parts. So thereby my, my strength, my strong body parts will keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I want to, I want to isolate the ones I'm trying to lift. And that, that's, that's completely different than... Uh, just getting in there and mindlessly throwing shit around. It seems to be a big deal in bodybuilding, trying to figure out how to isolate and concentrate on one thing. Well, if you want to develop weak body parts, it has to be, right? Yeah, I mean, just right. it's it's not about moving away from point A to point B. Whereas powerlifting, it's like I'm Momentum, trying to get as stable as possible can, yeah. and get as strong as possible to move this way from here to here. Bodybuilding is complete, literally polar opposite, where I'm trying to isolate a muscle and make it the weakest link in the chain. It's amazing how that transfers over to everything in life, too. I mean, you're... You, on a daily basis, you're trying to do a bunch of stuff. You're trying to get a bunch of work done, but you're trying to isolate things to try to concentrate on like one given thing. Right. And the people that are the best, they execute the best on just that one thing. Dude, Somebody focus. like Steve Jobs who made yeah. four hundred million dollars in like three years or whatever it was, some, yeah. something absurd like that. Uh, he his company and he was able to kind of hone in and focus in on 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 one thing. Right. I mean, even the iPhone itself and the iPad um, and uh, it, everything else they made looks similar to that one product and everything was in an effort to make that one product as good as possible. Running faster and faster in the wrong direction doesn't get to where you want to go, right? <laughs> like it's not the I'm, idea. I'm like, at it. Right. <laughs> yeah. like, working hard isn't the solution. It's working smart first and then learning how to work hard, right? Like yeah. if you're working hard on the wrong things, this looks stupid. So this is what I try to teach everybody. It's always, it always has to be, um, you know, for bodybuilding or muscle building, it's always has to be execution before effort. Effort definitely is a huge piece. But it has to be execution first. And that's the same in, in life, man. It's like you got to learn how to read before you can learn how to read fast. Right. right. We we're talking a little bit before about, um, before the podcast about overtraining and about like how much is too much. Mm -hmm. And um, as you get older, what have you found as far as um, lifting, you know, uh, the amount of times you lift per week and sure. the amount of uh, volume you put in per week and how that affects you. Yeah, I think that may be one of the biggest mistakes that I made and most people make um, early in my career was um, just being attached to I'm going to be the hardest working mofo out there. If anyone was in training, I'm going to crush them. And, um, you know, the idea of hard work, we all attach as the badge of honor and we love to be able to work hard. But for most people, it's just too much. Like, you with with the amount of stress we're subjected to in our day-to-day -day life when we talked about this it's like you know wake up in the morning your phone's going off you're getting emails that are causing stress then you're you know you're on your way to work and somebody cuts you off you're stressed you get to work your boss is yelling at you mark's being a prick you're stressed yeah. you know you open your email you're stressed you know you're, you get home from work your wife's pissed off you're stressed like all these things are just stress 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 and then we add the workout load on top of that yeah and your body's just in this constant state of stress so if the workout itself is uh, just an additional stress it can't build muscle like it like your body just always in this sympathetic state as we were talking about the autonomic nervous system so um the thing that i've done man is, is learning to one manage my life stress manage my perception of stress you know i've added meditation and breathing which has changed my life 
Um, and I think everybody who wants to build muscle should must make that a part of their routine. If you truly want to build muscle or get strong or get lean, you have to. Because and it's just in looking at the science of it, it's just like the autonomic nervous system has two branches: sympathetic and parasympathetic. And if you're in a sympathetic state all the time, all those things you're trying to do are literally an impossibility. So finding a way, whatever means that is for you, to get into this parasympathetic state, and uh, especially you know as soon as you're done training, the thing I teach everybody now is like, hey man, when you're done training. Go sit in the corner by yourself. Put your phone away. Five minutes of breathing. Uh, stimulate that parasympathetic nervous system. You That's know, probably really people, hard for people yeah, to do. People are like, oh, I want bigger arms, dude. What the fuck? Right. Yeah. It's, it's weird, right? But like, if you start to understand the mechanics of the science of what actually needs to happen, the, the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight. The parasympathetic is rest and digest. If I'm if I'm in parasym if I'm in sympathetic, I can't build muscle. So I want to be in rest and digest twenty two hours a day. Right, two hours a day I'm in the gym. Let's go parasympathetic. Let's go hard, which is you know cortisol, adrenaline. I want, I want all those things running. Twenty two hours a day I want to be anabolic. I want to be parasympathetic, which is you, you got to chill out, man. And you guys know bodybuilders, man. Bodybuilders are on their own schedule. The best bodybuilders in the world are the least stressed guys, you know. Yeah, they're all like you know chilling out. They're two hours late. They seem they very care. laid back. Dude, yeah, and that's the reality of it, man. Is that's just your, their genetic programming. They have just these relaxed personalities, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to be a great bodybuilder, you got to learn to be stress free. Yeah, and a lot of them, you look at it, and you're like, ah, oh, guys, it's like big and lazy, but they're Dude, that's, they're really that's, it's part that's of part of the part of the bodybuilding, being yeah. like docile almost, right? Yeah, like you yeah, know, they're not putting in too much energy yeah. doing anything. During my career, I attached to, I, I was able to block out stress really well. I, I literally said, like, you know, there could be a uh, you know a bomb going off next door, but there's a gym over here. I got to get legs done, man. Like, I'll, as soon as legs done, I'll, I'll come help. But like, I got to get this done. And that was always like, yeah, my perception of stress was always great, and that maybe what allowed me to, um, you know, be successful as a bodybuilder. Well, I think as you get older too, your perception of stress changes a lot, massively. You're What's like, it? oh, that's not that. I mean, that's right. not that big. Like, Speaking of stress, like, like, what does it feel like to be involved in? I mean, the Mister Olympia contest. That's got to be a huge deal. Like, how does that feel to be up there? And I think at that point, the stress was over for me. That was the easiest. The day-to-day -day grind in the gym was the stress for me because I, I hated it, right? Like, I, yeah. I, I put so much pressure on myself to be the best. Like, every day had to be a world-class workout. Otherwise, I was pissed. And if you got in my way of accomplishing a world-class workout, I was gonna, I was pissed. Yeah. Do you have training partners? Yeah, early in my career, I did. I You know, when I grew up in Canada, I had some really great training partners, man. And, um, you know... As I get older, I really didn't like. I, and to be honest, like not, not not to be arrogant, but I would try. Like I'm like, hey man, let's try to find some training partners. But nobody ever wanted to train hard. Like you know, everybody was, <laughs> I don't want to train legs with you. I'm like, I had I had some great guys. Don't get me wrong, right. but like a lot of guys just didn't want to didn't want to work right. hard. Well, and maybe your mind is drifting off into worrying about their intensity level, and you're not even thinking about your own as much anymore. Right. I mean, you know, right? It always ended up benefiting them more than it ended up benefiting me, right? Because <laughs> right. like, I, I would do my best as a training partner. My objective is I want to make your workout the, as as good as right. it can possibly be. Yeah, and I would expect that in return. And if I didn't get that, like, what the hell's the point? It's hard for people to do that. You know, it, it's not that hard for somebody to meet up with you on a training session and to put put in a good effort for you know, one training session right. where they but run they into you right. like, you know, once a year or whatever. Right. right. But yeah, for them to do it every day, like right. they get done with the workout, you're both demolished. Obviously the other guy's more demolished and be like, all right, see you tomorrow. Right. Yeah. You know, the guy's like, huh? It's it's hard to be consistent though with somebody that's a savage. I used to train with O'Hearn yeah. and like, I, you know, I'd get run down a lot because he yeah. was like a machine and I would get run down, you know? So it's hard to, it's hard to even keep up, you know? Yeah. yeah Some yeah, people definitely. that build great work capacity. You yeah. know, and that's and, something that a lot of bodybuilders have a like great work path work that, capacity. that was one of, if i had a genetic gift that was it it was um, my aerobic capacity was superior to yeah. most people um you know even at 310 pounds i feel like i could run a marathon I, sure. I, my aerobic capacity was fantastic i feel like that's important for a bodybuilder to get a lot of work done in a kind of short condensed period of time yeah i mean ultimately it's about creating stress right it's about creating a novel stress to your body you have to be able to do that and, and most bodybuilders don't have good cardiovascular capacity which could be actually a benefit looking at as, as i still learned to understand the biochemistry a little bit more um i think it's important to be able to have uh, to, the ability to manipulate the, the amount of stress so either if it's sometimes it's really dense sometimes you space right. out the density um, but for me, that was literally the only advantage I had because I wasn't strong. Like, I mean, I was mm -hmm. I was weak, relative, I mean, relative right? Yeah. Right. Um, but those guys are much stronger than me. But my genetic advantage is I do two sets to every one. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Health is, seems to be a big factor because you're talking about like meditation and stuff yep. like that. Is that something you realized early on or is that something you realized later? And I've been meditating since 2007, the first time I moved to California. And uh, I kind of did it sporadically 
Um, but now since retiring from bodybuilding, I mean, we all know the mental health is, is everything, man. Yeah, yeah. Your, your brain is everything. So um, I view my body now, man, like I'm, I'm trying to live forever. I want, I want to take care of everything. So I'm paying attention to everything. And, and I realized that um, it, doesn't not, it doesn't even matter so much what goes into your mouth. It matters what your body does with it. So, um, you know, eating great food and being stressed all the time is not going to solve your health problems. So learning how to manage your mental stress is very important. Yeah, that that's huge. Um, when it when it comes to uh, you know being able to battle through stuff and having mental stress, and uh, you know when it comes through some of these hard workouts, how are you able to battle through uh, just the pain? You know, bodybuilders for some reason they maybe it's just a pra- maybe it's a practice thing, but they're able to uh, just handle a ton of punishment in yeah. a workout. These squat workouts where right. you're supersetting squats and like it's, leg extensions and question, stuff like that. It's a great question. That was actually part of the reason I retired. Was it feels um, like a part of your brain's like almost on fire in some weird right. way. You're like, what is this? Like, well, I can't get away the, from it. The that. only answer is clarity of purpose. If you don't have a very clear purpose as to why I'm doing this, you don't stand a chance. I was so clear on what I wanted to do from the time I was young. It's like I'm gonna be in the Mr. Olympia, and every time, every time somebody said no, I just smile and keep walking. And uh, I knew I was gonna be in the Mr. Olympia. There was never a doubt in my mind for a second, mm-hmm. and that was the only thing I would picture. I wanted the best legs in the world, um, and I just—that's what I was envisioning every single time on every single rep. Every time I got tired, I literally had this visual of like what exactly I wanted my legs mm-hmm. to look like. And without that clarity, man, you don't stand a chance. And the reason I said that's a, you know um, why I retired was. I no longer had that purpose, right? You know, for after two, after my daughter was born. To be honest, my daughter mm-hmm. is now four, and after she was born, I couldn't be the same person. I didn't have that same purpose, man, because it was taking away from my time with my family, with my daughter, and I have a son as well. But yeah, um, yeah, that, that clarity of purpose for anybody out there who wants to accomplish a goal. You know this, man. Like you have you have a clarity mm-hmm. of purpose for your business, right? For your family, for like you're like I want to be this person, and if you don't have that, you you can't be successful. You learn a lot in the squat rack. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you learn a lot about yourself, right? You learn a lot about your um, your desire to be lazy, which I know I was very <laughs> lazy as a kid, man. You learn a lot about um, your balls. You learn a lot about your character. Right. Um, I learned a lot, man. And um, I learned a lot about my ego, <laughs> uh, my ego's desire to, to crush everybody else that came through. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot, man. Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds funny in some ways, but there there are a lot of lessons that you learn that are, you know, literally from being under the bar yeah and uh you know you sometimes you get in the middle of a set and you did uh you know rep number nine and maybe you're set out to do 12 reps and just because you do 12 reps you stop there but if you really try to push it past that um it kind of almost seems like in most cases as long as your form's not breaking down too much you can keep going you know there's Mm -hmm. like another rep and another rep and there's not only one more rep a lot of times sometimes there's three four and five more reps that you could squeeze out i don't attach to reps anymore man to be honest now i mean now that i'm retired during the last couple years of my career i didn't really either it's just i attach to like it's funny 95 percent of the time when i'm training my eyes are closed and and i'm inside my body feeling the muscle and i'm going until i can't go anymore or until i form until the form starts to break so until i feel like something other than my muscle that i'm training is being challenged uh, it's just I just try to get so zoned into like beating that muscle. Is going to failure crucial for a bodybuilder? Yes, yes, it is. I, I really believe it, and people are, argue that. But I think your the only argument would be um, going to failure too often may not be the best thing. But if you're going to failure, actu- act like actual failure, just do less volume. Right, and we're not talking about uh, maxing out to failure necessarily. Right. We're talking more like in the middle of a ten rep set, sure. where it's the last set, the last couple reps are. And it's it's absolutely imperative, and you know, a great training partner so you feel mentally safe is massive, right? So mm-hmm. I, I want to make sure that my my focus is the muscle, not completing reps. And, and that's one of the things I say a lot is like, you know, focus on contraction, not completion. As a bodybuilder, mm-hmm. as, an, as a power athlete, you're like, hey man, I just get get this rep up. Right. Whereas a bodybuilder, it's like, no, 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 no. I don't want to finish this rep. I want to challenge the muscle. So my only objective is how hard can I contract this muscle and then how much stability can I, can I create so I can contract the muscle harder? That's a very different objective than powerlifting. Yeah, it's 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 interesting that to have the form and technique so locked in, uh, you know, you kind of see these like bodybuilder reps. You know, sometimes you're seeing somebody doing like partial. Uh, it looks like they're doing like a half bench press and not locking out. Mm-hmm. Why do bodybuilders do that sometimes? The objective is, like I said, to challenge the muscle. So what is this muscle able to do right now? Like I'm not so I'm not attached to completing a rep. 
Mm. I'm attached to challenging a muscle. So if, you know, let's say I'm doing a bench press and I can do, you know, full rep and I get to six and like, oh shit, I can't do another full rep. So rather than finding a way to complete the rep, which my body will, you know, start using shoulders, start using other muscles, I'm just going to stay in that range that I'm still able to do with that working muscle. So the rep may get progressively smaller, um, but I'm still challenging the right muscle. When it comes to uh, social media, you know, what, how has social media, uh, you think, been beneficial to the sport and how has it been negative to the sport? Well, I talked to uh, a lot of people about this actually recently, but just the idea of um, the instant gratification that's necessary with, with social media is probably crushing the long-term um, goals of these people, right? It's like, I need to, I need to get, um, you know, that instant dopamine hit of somebody giving right. me a like today. A lot of times bodybuilders, and, and this is a very big generalization, but a lot of times, you know, in our dealings with a lot of bodybuilders is if you came into the gym and I said, oh man, what, you know, what have you been sick? You lose some weight. You'd be like demoralized. Sure. So sometimes uh, the ego of a bodybuilder can sometimes be oh, a, little, a little fragile and we would just do it messing around just to be dicks. But um, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it yeah. can be fragile because you're so focused in on that. Right. That is everything to you, building right. up size, building up mass and, and getting all the details right. Yeah, for most guys it is. And ideally it shouldn't be, right? It should right. be attached to the process and attached to like, if you master the process, your body's going to grow. It has to, like you're leaving no choice, right? Uh, but yeah, I think social media is crushing it for a lot of people. And uh, we all we all need the, the the PR today. We all need to post our abs today rather than like, hey man, I have this 10-year plan or this five-year plan of going to the Mr. Olympia contest or building a world-class body part or building a world-class body. Uh, it's definitely taken away from a lot of people. I can feel exactly what you're saying because like as a... Uh a filmmaker you work on the movie that's the big goal right yep and then like but every day i feel like i need to report something to everybody like i gotta tell everybody wants to see the movie now yeah right. i gotta tell everybody something like, uh, and then uh, where's the take, fucking movie by the way yeah, yeah. Take <laughs> there's a new one coming out may 29th <laughs> what's the where's the link can <laughs> i swipe yeah. up <laughs> yeah but so that's that's a thing like you said the, um the instant gratification is yeah. it's very important for people to get it now like i need it now yeah, and I really think that the greatest bodybuilders are the ones that don't need that. They they have this internal focus, this internal locus of control, and they um, they just go inside their own little world. Like talk about Dorian back in the day, right? He just no, he didn't need anybody else to tell him how great he was. Yeah, he's like, "Fuck you, I'm going to show you when I when I step on stage at Olympia, you'll know." Um, but I don't need you to tell me every day, and that's such an important thing. Um, and most people are so insecure in themselves; they need that external gratification. Yeah. So a truly great athlete doesn't seek that or they don't need it and i mean i think instagram uh develops that culture of i need this because once you once you get it you want it more right yeah. Like, oh, it's, yeah i need it more i need it more here comes a question i have to ask yeah. so um in bigger stronger faster i had a, a huge uh, moral dilemma with um using anabolics mm -hmm. you know um jumping over to what they call the dark side or whatever you yeah. know and i did it uh, of course and then like um just wondering as a professional bodybuilder do you face that or is it just part of the sport do you just accept it or so man you know my perspective now is different than when i was a kid obviously as a kid growing up in canada i knew nothing about it i knew it was part of the sport i knew nothing about it and uh, i was very lucky to have some very good advisors very young that didn't fuck me up because i think that's a huge part for young kids is yeah they get these idiots telling them what to do or they, mm. they learn from get big and this is this is what kai green stack is and you're like yeah. no it's not man it's just some idiot on there telling you what he <laughs> thinks it is and it's um, that gigantic list of drugs. Oh, too, right? it's ridiculous, yeah. right? And they're going to kill themselves. And then they're like, oh, I, you know, this is what I need to do to be because of Mr. Olympia. And like, no, you don't. You need to do the smallest incremental dose so you keep moving forward. Um, so obviously it's a part of bodybuilding, man. And um, the realization now is I try to advise people at, at least for a long time to not do it. Like, let, let's, learn, let's learn how to actually train first. Because most guys go, oh, if you want to be a bodybuilder, you just got to take this so much more than that man yeah. like it's in i think the big difference between the 70s and 80s and now is it, 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 back then it was a training culture like you trained hard you trained twice a day after done training you were done training what did you do you went to the beach you laid on the beach which is meditation in itself you, you recovered you connected with the earth now it's a drug-based culture so people think rather than having to train harder i just take more drugs and that's what's the, the difference in the physique now it's like people are so attached to the dose and and you yeah know, like well, trains? they think the drugs do everything and they right. don't really do much at all, really. Like when you really look at it, um, I think the biggest favor the world did to Mark and I was just keeping us off of steroids and mm -hmm. away from them until we were like in our, you know, late 20s and mm -hmm. early 30s and stuff. Because um, just 
being that young and diving into it, we would have it would have been detrimental to both of us. And right. So, like looking back on, I go like I'm glad I didn't try it when I was young, you know. Yeah. Because I didn't know enough about it. Yeah, I was very lucky, man. Like I said, to be uh, exposed to some bright people who one got me good things that were you know not real <laughs> yeah, not yeah. crap uh, and i didn't need a lot as soon as i touched it i responded so yeah. I, I didn't attach to like oh i need to take ridiculous amounts of everything i, I think just that's what a lot of people um th that's a big mistake a lot of people make too is just yeah. dumping a bunch of stuff on you know right. into your system Dude, and not and knowing and how much you the need amount or... of toxins are in there like the, sh the heavy metal shit people are killing themselves man and, and it's unfortunate and i think it's killing bodybuilding and I, you know i wish the government would um, at least I don't know, but legalize it, but allow people like, hey man, if you're gonna do it, go to your doctor, make like let your doctor yeah. control this stuff, because ultimately, man, like the, the uh, stuff coming from China is just killing people. Literally, and it's really people. difficult. Um, I, you know, we we talk about this all the time. I wish the process was actually easier to get your stuff prescribed and stuff like that, but it's um, it's not as easy as it should be, you know. Um, but there are some people out there trying to make it easier. So, and your blood work done is kind of an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it costs money and. Pain in the ass. Yeah, completely. And then try to find somebody that knows how to even uh, read it. There's a whole other And, and like, I love that you brought that up, man, because most doctors are going, oh, I just need testosterone. You don't fucking just need testosterone. There's every, it's all a cascade, man. It's all the HPX yeah. is influencing all these different hormones. You know, your luteinizing hormone, your follicle stimulating hormone, your DHEA, all these things are such massive components that just taking more testosterone is not going to get you the results you're after. You're one of the. Uh one of the smarter bodybuilders out there, in my opinion, you have a lot of information. Um, where are you pulling a lot of your information from? What are your, what are your sort of go-to uh, spots for information? Man, I'm, like you guys, man, I'm blessed to have a podcast where I get to literally call the smartest people in the world and ask them all the questions that I'm thinking about. So, start, you know, that that's where I what I do now. Yeah. Um, prior to that, man, like I said, I've got a university degree in the area of science and kinesiology and how the body moves and and a lot of exercise physiology. Uh, just just being a student of it, man. I take as many courses as I can. I read as many books as I can. Um, I'm always trying to, to kind of su decipher through and, and, and find the best information out there because we know there's a lot of bullshit. There's a lot of people out there, especially in the fitness industry. The fitness industry, I always say, is 30 years behind everybody else. So that, that was maybe the greatest thing I ever did was look outside the fitness industry for advice, uh, looking into professional athletics, professional trainers, Olympic trainers, um, you know, the best researchers finding those people because those are the guys who, um, you know, have a, if they have a very specific amount of knowledge that you can take and apply to your um, your necessity, what you need. Yeah. All of a sudden you, you've maybe made the sport better. Right. And that's kind of where my brain was. It's like, don't don't listen to other bodybuilders. Don't listen to other you know, people in this industry. Look outside and, and find out you can deduce some information and apply it to what you're doing. Do you think people can be leaner uh, without drugs versus with them? I've seen some of the, like, uh, you know, they're, they're drug tested, so I don't, you know, you don't know what the hell people are doing. Right. But sometimes the uh, drug tested athletes um, oh, have, have like kind of a harder look, like, right. you know, because uh, taking testosterone and things like that can cause some bloating and some things of that nature. So, Absolutely. you know, for those, for, for people that are listening that just want to get like lean and get, and get, get well, in good shape, I'll, you can accomplish you, a lot of these I'll tell things. You my opinion on that is a, that's a great question too. I, I understand your question now. Um, I think it's, I advise every single person who wants to compete to compete natural first, because as we just spoke about, what do, what do bodybuilders do to get in shape? Most bodybuilders don't want to train. They don't want to diet. They just take more shit. Yeah. They're like I'm going to take clombuterol. I'm going to take ephedrine. I'm going to take those other things. It's a drug based culture rather than like, Hey man, I'm just going to fucking diet. I'm just going to do some hard cardio. I'm actually going to do some hard leg workouts to burn some fat. Man, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality. You guys, you guys know that. Is it, like a lot of times, that's why I respect natural athletes so much. Is like these guys are putting the work, man. Mm. Like it's hard, man. It, it's hard to get in shape naturally. You're gonna suffer. Uh, so I suggest everybody do that at least once in their life and like learn how to learn how to diet, learn, learn how to gain suffer. a couple pounds of muscle. Fucking brutal. Yeah, it's yeah, really it's, it really is. It takes yeah. a lot of dedication. And that's where the six meals a day and the rest and the sleep and recovery and yeah. everything's going to be. I mean, it's always important, but it's going to even be that much more important. Yeah, and the inflammatory factor is obviously very different. And the growth hormones adds just a whole different dimension that people aren't aware of is making people insulin resistant and making them look bigger than they are. So mm -hmm. you know, everybody goes, oh, man, I screwed up my last week before the contest. <laughs> you know, I, I lost 15 pounds in the last three days. Well, 
No, you didn't screw up. You just actually lost the water that you were holding. So yeah. that's the problem. Most people, it's not actually dense muscle, right? It's just this, all this hyperemia from, you know, insulin and growth hormone and stuff. And then, oh, I screwed up my last week. You think people put way too much faith in uh, the idea of the drugs? Because like I'm saying, like a lot of people will look at somebody and they'll say like, oh, that guy, if, if I just took steroids all day and did this and that, like <laughs> I'd look like that too. Right. But like, I actually have done that. Like I've actually had points in my life where um, I took a lot of steroids and trained what? like crazy and and like I didn't look like those guys show you know no. what I mean so it's this like guy. I think that a lot of people um, put well it was like after I did bigger stronger faster and I, I was like oh it's okay to try to do this and took a bunch of stuff and nothing really great happened Dude, I felt know? that way about growth hormone I, like I, actually I just got injured I didn't do it when I until I was pro and I was I was expecting like oh it's just gonna take me to this next level that's what I was <laughs> I was yeah, especially <laughs> about 10 years ago or so people were talking about it like being such a crazy crazy thing and, I, and I've I've used it before myself and all I got was joint pain right <laughs> you know my hands got numb and yeah. my shit hurt and so then I got my like, bench oh, press fake or back up to like yeah, um, well 455 raw mm -hmm. and then I blew out my shoulder so and my triceps so it wasn't even, it wasn't worth it. And then not to give like some, you know, scary tale of like, oh, don't do it. You'll get hurt right. or anything. But it's just the, the plain truth of it was, it wasn't what it was sold to me as. Right. That it was going to be like this awesome, you know, thing. I get on steroids all of a sudden now, like now I'm ripped and now I'm in great shape. It is so hard to get lean right. and in great shape with the amount of dieting I'm doing. Right. That there's no drug in the world that could even match what I'm trying to do right. right now, you know? I love this conversation too, because people need to realize one, steroids aren't the solution to everything, but that being said, they are, I think a massive tool, a tool. For, Fantastic. for, yeah, yeah, yeah. For, especially for men over 35. On I mean, the flip like, side. Yeah. yeah. Every man should, I, I really believe should be living a great life, not just living. Like you should be living a healthy, vigorous, rigorous life. Right, where you down feel fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. um, right. Where you feel awesome. Right. I, I don't want to live to hundred and feel like shit and have no sex drive. Like I want to live to whatever. And every one of those years is excellent. And I feel like a million bucks. A boner so, every day. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a, I think it's an awesome tool. Um, but people shouldn't be afraid of it, nor should they think it's the holy grail that's going to get you everywhere you want to go. At the end of the day, like anything, there's no shortcuts, man. And I, in I think that's in true with like our diet too. Like we we want to, you know, like I, I'm on this uh, ketogenic diet and it's working great for me. But like that doesn't mean it's going to fit everybody, and doesn't mean it's going to um, be the answer for everything in my right. life. Like I still have pain and inflammation in my body. Right. We haven't completely gotten rid of everything yet, so. It's we, mm -hmm. we keep going until we find, and, and, you know, I talk about this things, all the yeah. time is people attached to one particular diet, but man, I'm a vegan or I'm a, I do if it fits your macros or keto, like, man, like it, it may work for you for a short period of time and you may have to change it. Yeah. So you just got to watch. You have to observe. I'm a like, person that eats food is what I am now. Yeah. Like, that's what I look at it. As. Yeah, I'm I'm not love doing keto. the same thing forever, right? Dude, I love <laughs> keto. It makes my brain feel great, but definitively my performance goes to shit and I get fat every single time. Maybe my, maybe my ratios aren't right. You could, you could argue whatever yeah. it is, but that's just my observation. I feel mentally on point. I feel amazing, but my, I can't train. My performance goes to shit. No matter how what my keto levels are, if I'm supplementing. Well, let's with talk a little shit. bit about diet. Do yeah. you have to? Um, do you count how many carbs you eat? Do you count how many calories you eat? Do you count anything? Man, right now I'm not counting anything. You just did way too much of that. I did way too much of that, man. My, I attach now to eating less, uh, less often, uh, but I'm not really training that much now. So um, that's yeah, the breakfast basically. I served you this morning. Yeah, exactly. He's like, fast, <laughs> motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Mark, I will. <laughs> you're like, hey, you want to meet for breakfast? Nope. Nope, yeah, you're fasting. Yeah. He's, Mark's writing my diet now. <laughs> <laughs> That's my script. No food. And, and yeah. a pat on the back. Yeah. Send you on your way. Yeah. Smack me on <laughs> the Don't ass. worry, it'll be better for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so <laughs> diet now, man, is like, I'm, I'm trying to support health. I, I attach, like, if, if I were to say I attach to any type of diet, I attach to the, to a low infl infl inflammation diet. So whatever's going to minimize inflammation for me. Um, so I'm not eating anything that's what I know to be pro-inflammatory. So there's no sugar, not a high, not a lot of omega sixes. Um, yeah, I mean, like, so I eat, I always say, like, what's high in omega six? Like chicken? No. Uh, well, yeah. So anything it can be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what are you? Like, what are we looking at? Grain-fed chicken. So anything that's um, like vegetable oils. Don't eat a lot of vegetable oils. Like not a lot of corn products. Um, what are these things called? Like PUFA or something like that, right? Yeah, like so polyunsaturated, polyunsaturated fats, fats yeah, yeah, right, right. Or, or monounsaturated fats. Yeah, so I'm manipulating. Um, I just try to eat a lot of vegetables. I try to, I try to eat really high quality meat, so everything is either wild or uh, grass fed. I eat a lot of omega 3s. Um, 
a lot of um, avocado, olive oil, like omega nines. So I don't. So, so sometimes you go to like a restaurant and uh, they they like Black Bear Diner, for example. You go to like one of these you know diners, these uh, greasy spoon type places, mm -hmm. and people sometimes wonder like, "Fuck, man, I had breakfast at eight, and they're not hungry until three o'clock, four o'clock." Right. And part of the reason for that is they're cooking this cooking these things and in, in these vegetable oils right exactly yeah you can't really break them down very easily right. it causes a lot of inflammation one of the best things about retiring from bodybuilding because i'm not attached to having to eat every two to three hours anymore like i'll go six or eight hours and i won't eat so i'm not i usually don't eat out anymore because like if i'm hungry i'm like oh i just wait two more hours i'll be home i can yeah. actually cook yeah. something that's good that's a pretty awesome feeling. Do you cook man. most of your food, you're saying? 95%. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 95%. I don't even eat well, sushi that's, uh, anymore, man. more economical, too. You know, people ask a lot about, you know, how much, you know, sure. shit, man, this is going to cost a lot and that's going to cost a lot. Well, it, it can, uh, but in the case of uh, trying to uh, feel good, in the case of right. trying to be healthy and to try to be leaner, uh, normally the, the goal is you're going to end up eating less at some point. And right. so, therefore, even if the quality of food is high, uh, the price shouldn't be too yeah. terrible. I think the price of food for me is still really high because i am seeking out that really high quality yeah, stuff. high quality stuff yeah yeah but I, I'd what about um that. what about the rest of the family how do the kids eat man it's funny my daughter since she was six months old has eaten at least 80 percent of her meals on my lap which means she's eating <laughs> the same food as me <laughs> yeah so, it's uh like brian shaw has been doing something yeah. somewhere with his son he's just kind of eating the same Dude, thing his and son plows through steak my, my, steak well, and my daughter rice same thing. salmon sweetheart what do you want for breakfast steak and kale i'm like amazing okay, for breakfast every day my son is a completely different ball game <laughs> My son he just likes wants, cereal. Yeah, no, he just he just wants junk, man. So, yeah. but we still we always. And how pick, old is he? He's six. We pick um, good versions of junk. So, yeah. like, I'll still make calves. It. <laughs> I think my daughter's got the physique. She's to got be the honest. calves. Yeah, my daughter is the athlete in the family. She's I got think. calves and bubbly form. And how old is she? <laughs> she's, all she's four. Before. she's four yeah my son, she's a gymnast she's a dancer but she's a beast of an athlete man That's my cool. son's the emotional one <laughs> yeah right yeah so uh, but yeah so he doesn't eat well but we always try to still like you know my rule is if it's in the house you can eat it so we still try to find great versions of the junkier foods so there's no cereal man like but so but i'll make them pancakes but i'll make them keto pancakes you guys yeah. appreciate that so you know like co coconut flour since based. you have kids Just being do you, conscious uh, too man. yeah do you uh ever obsess about their nutrition or you ever think about that a lot like what are they gonna man, what am i putting into their gut microbiome uh, more and... than i probably should well so I, I i fight with it right as when i was when they were very young i tried to be a little bit laid back about it i'd be like oh it's okay i if going back i would have been even more neurotic about it because as soon as they get a taste for that crap they're not going back sure they're not going back so there they are there's my munchkins <clears throat> And yeah, oh, that's my daughter's Presley and my son is Benjamin. Very cool. Um, yeah, awesome human beings. I, see, I agree with what you're saying. Is like once you taste it, you know, you're, you're going to want that forever. Right. And then people will argue, well, they're going to get it at school and you're depriving, you know, you're depriving kids and right. everything. It's like, are you really depriving boy. people? No. Like I, you know, I got picked on a lot. I Every day I spent in school, like upset because I was i was fat you know like i was i, I didn't like myself like right. i don't i don't think you're depriving people of anything in a way so no, man, you can look at it as being beings. mean but Dude, we're human beings we're meant to eat what comes from the earth we're not meant to yeah. eat what comes from the grocery store yeah well, so and parents are you know you're there to protect your child yeah and sometimes uh you know food might be the enemy i don't think uh, mac and cheese is a meal right i just and, don't and think most it is parents are so concerned about you know being the good parent that they're going to give their kid whatever they want and yeah. that's not a good parent right a good parent is someone who, who develops a strong child not someone who just fucking gives them whatever they want like <laughs> oh shut up i want you to be happy like here sure. eat these doritos like and there's a difference between giving your kid a treat and giving it to him every day you know right, right? yeah and man there's so many you know the nutrition uh, community has evolved so much there's so many healthy options like, you can give your kids stuff that tastes good that isn't going to ultimately I think, destroy their brain. Yeah, I've moving. been teaching my kids about nutrition from the time they were really little. And uh, my daughter is uh, 10. And at one point she was like, oh, you know, I'm." she said she's uh, getting rolls. She's like, I'm getting <laughs> I'm getting these rolls. And I was like, okay. I was like, well, we've talked about nutrition before. I was like, uh, I was like, there's a lot of options. I was like, I can go over a bunch of stuff with you. So I, I, we can even look at like a book on Amazon. Right. We can. So I got her eat this, not that. It's for kids. 
she lost like nine pounds. She didn't right. do anything. She didn't so do anything drastic. My response to that is, I don't even tell them about the food, man. I just let them eat, and then I right. said, "Well, if if you if you feel that way, let's go do some more exercise." Yeah. Like it's not even exercise. Let's go right. play more. Let's go for a run. It's never exercise. It's like let's go to the yeah. park. Right, right. Let's go for a run. That's, let's go we, for a walk. We walk more often. Yeah, and man. Stuff just like that. just manipulating their their right. energy output, right? Like that's that's the reality in life. You've got two opportunities, right? You've got calorie intake, your energy output, and it's one or the other, man. So just. Yeah, right. Like, hey, let's let's go for a walk. As soon as they get up in the morning, let's go for a walk. I just think it's so important, like moving forward with what we're doing, that it's important that we inspire the younger kids out there it's to the eat good. You're gonna get a real I don't really care about inspiring somebody my age to eat good right. at this point. Right. I might have already lost so, you a long time ago. Yeah. But if you're fifteen years old and you're, you know, following Mark and I or you want to get stronger and powerlifting all this stuff, and you're following what we're eating now, I think that we're setting a good example. And that's yep. what I'd like to continue to do is just uh set so, a good example and provide real solid good information i didn't realize you guys had a desire to help kids man i've got a really interesting uh, project that i'm starting on that i think is similar idea man it's like little let's change the fitness industry and if we're going to do it we're not going to start with the adults we're gonna start that, that's what i think yeah mm -hmm. we're we're <laughs> even look, looking forward with the documentary that we're doing it's like how can we sort of teach the younger generation to eat good because it's one thing that mark and i really missed out on when we talk about like bigger stronger faster like we were just talking about this in the car on the way here it's like we wanted to become bigger and stronger our whole life but mm -hmm. we got bigger and fatter mm -hmm. because we just didn't know we were unaware we had the genetics we had the the tool set to be strong but we didn't have the tool set to be lean because we just didn't know right and sort of if we can guide kids in that, that right that's direction the difference, now, right? Well, i found you, out you a did lot have earlier than yeah you found out yeah. a lot younger than yeah. i did you too. did have the ability to be lean you absolutely did we all do right? yeah like maybe some of us will be easier than others but we, we don't have, have the, the knowledge ability. i guess yeah like yeah, the knowledge yeah, but that that's the cool thing is let's empower them with that with just the knowledge of like i call it the internal locus of control like if, if you want it you can do it because someone out there has the steps it's just it's not that you can't you just don't know the steps yet so that that realization is so important it was really people. weird too because like we're, we've been talking about this for a while like i did the carnivore diet mm -hmm. way back in 1993 20 something years ago mark and i both uh, did it but we didn't know why we were doing it and we right. didn't know why it worked so when you come back 20 did something some years later thing meets to drop yeah, some weight did it yeah. to drop some <laughs> weight but when you come back like 20 something years later and you realize like why you were doing that and why it worked and why you were able to stay strong while you were powerlifting and things like that it becomes a lot more interesting so you guys both following the carnivore diet now just yeah for right now mm -hmm. i've been doing it for um two months um my you know my body fats improved my blood works improved i would love to go over it with you and show mm -hmm. you the stuff and see what you think can improve even further because there's always more work and my, my, thing, my, done, my first you know? thing that comes to mind and i've never done it so i won't i won't talk to it but my first thought is just micronutrients like your body needs micronutrients you, you're everything is um, your mitochondria is responsible for everything right sure and without the proper um micronutrients to support digestion to support cellular processes i just i don't know but i speculate that at some point there's got to be some deterioration but again, look at your blood, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I speculate that too. Like it seems at some point there's going to be something that's missing. Right. But you're right. Like so look at the blood and see if that there type is. of diet. See, like if, if you look at the the idea of eating for the seasons, like you know, if you lived in the north, you probably in the winter time all you probably ate was meat because you didn't have access to plants. Whereas there was a right. seasonality sure. to your food. So you're doing so, it in three four months. Yeah, and you do yeah. three four months, and then maybe in the spring, oh now I've got all these plants and, and, berries I could, and stuff, right, yeah. and maybe there's a seasonality to eating. <clears throat> that seems to make most sense to my brain. Like. Where did you? Where did your your you know ancestors right. evolve? It's, it is really interesting that now, like all we're thinking about is like what people used to eat a long time ago, Irony, and right. we're trying to figure it out, like reverse right. engineer it. I I feel that after doing this for you know twenty plus years on and off, and uh, after going you know into this carnivore diet, it seems to me the ketogenic diet seems to be fairly effective um, for a lot of different things, um, but it, it also seems to me that riding that fine line of really not getting into ketosis it it feels like to me that's the be, that's kind of the best spot to live in is that metabolic flexibility yeah that yeah, you have the metabolic flexibility to yeah. have some carbohydrates here and there so for me i'll have a sweet potato here and there i'll have some rice here and there it's i'll exactly have an orange here and there yeah, it's kind of like the only word probably, i like le, probably a little word less I like, probably metabolic a little, flexibility probably yeah, like yeah. a little bit less than maybe what you're doing but i will shift into adding more carbs in i feel it's, like it's i've had not, to kind of correct not, myself that's what I'm doing. It's exactly what I'm doing. And you know how I choose when I'm having carbs? So three or four days a week, I don't have carbs. 
the days that I train, I put in carbs. Because what am I doing? I'm depleting my body's yeah. glycogen stores. Yeah, so you just put them back in. Yeah, based on how much I train. If I train hard, right. I do high volume, I need a little more. And here's where the carbs, I think, are really interesting. And you'll know a ton more about this than, than I will. But, you know, when you bring in the carbohydrates, I think people forget that it's a carbohydrate. It does help hydrate your body. And it's going to help bring nutrients into the muscle sure. so <clears throat> the carbohydrates can be used as uh, almost like a supplement or a tool you want to bring sodium potassium and whatever else into exactly. your muscles and that's that's, and that's a great why way i to feel do like it. you can't perform i mean you know dom and d'agostino and jacob Wilson yeah. may may refute this but i just don't feel like you can perform maximally on that type of diet is you know as a bodybuilder i tried it for a long time mm -hmm. you know even get it ready for a contest i yeah. was very low carb relatively high fat and definitively I, I knew my yeah. performance wasn't there. I know? agree hundred percent. I don't, yeah. I don't think there's in my, in my opinion, I, I, I don't think there's even a, a debate. I think that the, the best diet I've ever been on in terms of uh being able to lift heavy, being able to stay lean has been a bodybuilding diet with a small modification of, of bumping up the fat a little bit. For me, it, it I needed a little bit more energy. That was it. Yeah, that's the limitation with the bodybuilding diet for everybody out there. Like, you know, what diet do you follow? You, know, you follow the 90s, I call it the 90s bodybuilding diet, where it's like very high carb, very high protein, very low fat. The problem there is you're not supporting your brain, you're not supporting your hormone <laughs> development, you're not supporting your nervous system. So, um, I always, like I said, I'm manipulated according to my training. If I'm doing a high amount of neurological training, which is a strength-based training, your body needs more fat. You know, if I'm doing a, a very metabolic style training, so then I'm going to need more carbohydrates. When you were bodybuilding professionally, were you eating a lot of fat then or were you low fat guy? I cycled through it, man, always. Early in my career was like zero fat, like most people when they but start But as out. a show came along, you probably had to pull some of the fat out, right? I did. I pulled some of the carbs out. Oft, often, I pulled the carbs out and I put the fats up. Okay. Um, just, just again, it was cycle. It was. Cyclical. How much do you think that calories matter? There's a lot of debate about that. Um, I think at some level they matter, but it's the most important thing is not what you eat, but how your body absorbs it and how, what your body does with it. And I think the realization that uh, the type of food does matter because it's all creating a different biochemical response. Like if I eat a sweet potato compared mm. to a pop tart, it's not the same thing. Um, my, micro, my microbiome deals with it differently. The different types of polysaccharide, a different length of carbohydrate chain, uh, all this stuff, it, it matters. It has to matter. Your, yeah. your biochemistry is different. So, um, you know, how much? I don't know. Like, I mean, it's all speculative, right? But there, th definitively, if you're trying to get in the best shape of your life and perform the best that you can, it, you can't just concern yeah. yourself with That's just some calories. Of some of it's about volume, too. You sure. just don't have the room for stuff that's not going to advance you. Right. I mean, plain and simple, yep. anyone who has, who does flexible dieting, you look at their diet and as they get closer to, if they compete, you're like, okay, well that just turned into a bodybuilding diet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you exactly. know, you're like, it looks exactly like the same way everyone else preps for a show pretty much. So yeah. it, 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 at some point it's all going to have to kind of swing, uh, swing in that direction. You know, one thing is, uh, that I think we undersell ourselves on is, is the training. Mm -hmm. The training is crucial. The training's huge. So if you, and I'm sure you've dealt with this going into shows before, if the diet obviously is a huge part of it, but if you're dieting so hard that you can't train, how are you going to look on stage? Right. And I think a lot of bodybuilders live that life and they get attached to like, I need a pre-workout, I need a caffeine stimulant. And then you get into this idea of the more stimulants you're taking, the more, per the more sympathetic stress you're creating. So you're uh, thinking about your getting your waistline down. You're thinking about being leaner, and that's that's where your mind yeah. is at. And even just for the average person who's thinking those terms, it, it can be detrimental because the training is going to be uh, not the most important thing, but it's a huge factor. You got to be able to go in the gym, and you got to be able to fuck shit up. You got to yeah. be able to really train hard. Well, that's your greatest opportunity to burn fat. Your greatest opportunity to burn calories. So I think that's where cyclical um, nutrition comes in, right? Cyclical calorie mm. or or carbohydrate consumption is probably your greatest opportunity because. You have that one or two days of replenishing your body, and that's probably going to sustain you for three or four days after that. So you get those few days of really, really high intense training sessions and build your workouts around it. So if you get two or two days of like replenishing, we'll build your highest effort and your your, your highest intensity workouts around that, and then allow your body ex expect your body to be, uh, you know, phasing down uh, for a couple of days after those replenishment days. Anybody that you modeled your uh, bodybuilding career after, you looked up to a lot, or just Dorian just, was my guy, man. Like yeah. like most guys in that in that era, like Dorian was the man. Ah, oh, dude, he's just so hard and, and uh, just crazy, right? Like 
First bodybuilder I ever really attached it to, like, holy shit, I want to look like that. I literally cut his pictures out and I paste them around yeah, the we gym. we were inspired and fired up by him. Blood and guts. Oh, they got oh, all man. these pictures of his underwear and his underwear hanging up. And we're like, who yeah, cares? He's so jacked. Yeah. No, we had, we had pictures of him in his underwear. That, yeah. All those famous pictures were like, yeah. And I love so where gross. he's evolved to now. And if you guys have talked to him lately, man. But he, I he's great, I, yeah. I love that, man. So, I mean, you know, I'm he's living, doing yoga and yeah, stuff. I'm living yeah. a very similar life because we realize, you know, I always talk about life, this transcendence of life where. We spend so many years, and you guys are related, so many years like accumulating things. We're trying to accumulate money. We're trying to accumulate muscle. We're trying to accumulate strength, whatever it is. And you get there, and you get to the top of the world, and you go, oh, it's not quite what I expected it to be. It's, it's for most part, it's a lonely place. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's very similar to growing your body. You're like, man, I just want to have fucking big arms. I want to fill out the sleeves of my shirt. And then what do you do? Yeah, yeah, you wear a long sleeve shirt. Exactly right, though. It's a long, it's <laughs> a lonely place. At right, the you top. get there, so then, then you, you know, once yourself. you've achieved it, you're by yourself, and then you spend so many years trying to realize, oh, it's not what I thought it would be. Now, now I'm going trying inside. to get back to being normal. No, well, I'm going internal, right? So yeah. we all have this external, like I, I want to accomplish money or, yeah. or or muscle or whatever it is, and then realize the true journey, the true benefit is going inside of yourself and. Um, you know, just mastering this thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of working, you know, working out and not a lot of working in. Yeah. You know, people aren't yeah. like internalizing. They're not paying attention to what's going on uh, inside their body. And I think your your training sessions are a great opportunity for that. Like, I almost don't even I know. Love it, man. I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to figure out how to get that from anything else. You know, relationships you can you can find it within relationships uh, uh, occasionally, but it, it's it's really like in the training session when you're trying to push yourself a certain way, or even just maybe not even push yourself, but just trying to kind of feel what you're supposed to be feeling. Pay attention. And I always say, that's, man, I love that you say that because I feel like I was the only guy having that conversation, but. It's, it's your, your training ground for life, right? It's like every day I get to go in there and see what my ego wants to do, see what my body wants to do, learn my body, um, you know, learn my, my mind, learn my, where my mind wants to be lazy, or learn where my ego wants to, to you know, puff up and, and not actually complete right. the objective, but, you know, attach to, I want to post my PR today. I think it's such a great breeding ground for success, that everyday practice of challenging yourself yeah. and, you know, sticking to your routine and showing yourself you have the discipline to win every single day. It can sound really corny, but like if you were to go to the gym and you were to start to warm up, let's say you hopped on a bike or something, and let's say it's a leg day and you're thinking about training. If you're sitting there convincing yourself that it's going to be a great day, you're going to build up build up what you're trying to build up. You're going to accomplish what you're going to try to accomplish. You're visualizing. Maybe you said closing your eyes. Mm -hmm. Maybe even for your first couple sets of squats, you know, you don't have any weight on the bar. It's just it's just the bar. Maybe even some body weight squats. You can really kind of walk yourself through what this day is going to look like <clears throat> and set yourself up for success. Give yourself the best opportunity. Yep. Um, maybe you know, maybe it's a very particular thing. Maybe you're a bodybuilder and you need to work on a very specific part of your quad to bring up, or maybe you're a powerlifter and maybe you lean forward too much on your squats, or maybe uh, you know, maybe you just have a shitty squat in general. But if you think that you have a shitty squat or you think that you have shitty legs, then you're correct, and it's going to always stay that way. So, Walk into the gym, slump shoulders, like, oh, man, I got a deadlift today. Right. Well, yeah, of course you're going to deadlift like shit like that. So the way I look at it is is, <laughs> is every time you, you change those thoughts, you create a, a neurochemical signature, a neurochemical um, design in your mind. So you have, you know, your basic neurotransmitters, and, and that's going to be associated with the, the state of mind. So right. you're literally creating the state of mind. And every time you do that, it's either going to be a positive one or a negative one. And you just keep, every time you go back in the gym, like we talked about earlier, you're bringing that back. So, you know, taking that five minutes before you train to create that ideal brain state for yourself so that you're ready to go in there and crush it. It's, it's, I mean, it's such a great opportunity. And if you look at the neurochemistry of it, there's a great book, if anybody's interested, called Buddha's Brain. Uh, it, tell, it tells you everything about um, the neurochemistry and, and all the neurotransmitters that are going on and how you can influence them. Uh, super interesting stuff. I grew up with a lot of support. You know, we, we grew up with a lot of support from our parents and stuff like that. It sounds like you, it sounds like you did not, you know, where I, I had a, we had tons of, tons of love, tons of affection, tons of support. And that support kind of allowed us to, I would say, dick around, allowed us to play different sports and to uh, explore lifting and some different things and kind of stumble upon some of the things that we've stumbled upon. But at this point in your life, you must feel fucking great to have reached uh, this, uh, this like, um, I'd say, like area of like clarity in your life where things are, are com coming more clearly, uh, almost like an enlightened life in a way. Yeah, um, you know, I struggled a lot as a kid, and, and you know that's why I chose bodybuilding, and it allowed me to face my struggles, allowed me to face my insecurities and my um, inadequacies, I guess. Um, and because 
I, I've been able to face all those things and um, learn to become comfortable with them. Uh, it's allowing me to just continue to evolve. And by by no stretch am I, um, you know, the most evolved person, but at least right. I'm, I'm aware of it. And I think becoming aware of it is step one in changing it, right? And um, I think for everybody, just, just taking complete control for everything is the, the first step. So, yeah, man, I feel awesome. And I feel like the the world's a great place and we, have, we all have such great opportunities if you create them that way. That's it's cool. Good. You uh, share some of these things that you've learned with your kids or you feel they're too young. Like uh, I kind of sometimes find myself, you know, having these weird conversations with my kids and I'm like, oh my God, it's embarrassing. I think they're like way too young for me to be talking to them this way, but I kind of still do anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, for my kids, man, I, I realize they're my greatest teachers because as you'll, you'll know this, man, it's like they're a reflection of you. Any, mm -hmm. Their inadequacies are, inadequacies are just a reflection of your inability as a, as a parent, right? <laughs> right? So I think it's pretty awesome. You know, they've been a great learning opportunity for me. But, you know, the thing I teach them, man, is like I just try to teach them um, that they're in control. Like that everything they do is like, hey, you guys can, you can change it. You know, I don't, you know, I, I'm not good at this, dad, or I can't. Well, yeah. you know, no, I can't yet. You know, just just opening that door for them where they can go, Oh, I, I have the ability to change these things. I think empowering kids to realize that they can they can control anything. Yeah. That's all they need. Like right. cuz cuz ultimately the, they're so creative. They're, they have so much energy they can <laughs> yeah. do anything. Uh, they just need someone to not put those those walls around their brain. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's kind of my only objective with my kids, man, is let them live their life and without any walls. Yeah, sometimes they'll say, oh, I'm not, you know, I don't really like that that much. I'm not that good at it. And then you can say, well, you, you can be better at it. You just need something yeah. you have to work on. It takes time. But if you don't care to be good at it, that's fine too. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's, hard. that's always the fine line with children is, uh, you know, trying to figure out, um, you know, when to be their friend, when to be just strictly their parent type deal. Yeah. Have you, uh, you know, exposed your kids to sports and kind of said, Hey, this is what we're doing. And they begrudgingly uh, are getting, you know, driven to uh, gymnastics practice or whatever. Yeah, man, I started that with my son. So, uh, as I said prior to the podcast, my son's a very emotional kid, and I grew up like in a hard family. So I would be like, "Man, shut up, man up!" Like you know, like yeah, you like, have it way better than I did, kind of thing. Right. <laughs> uh, and I've learned now that you can't do that, man. Like so, like I said, he's emotional. He, he, there's a feminine side to him, right? He's just he's just an emotional kid. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've learned over the last couple of years. That's a hard thing to like understand <laughs> yeah. is that like we're so, everybody's yeah. so different, you yeah. know? And so I, my, my daughter yeah. will fall and scrape her face on the ground, literally get up and go, mm. and my son will get up and like, you know, for three days, they'll be like crying about yeah. it. And, I, and <laughs> at first she's like, God, shut up. Like, yeah. you know, you're your boy. But now I'm just like, hey man, let's just love him, right? At yeah. the end of the day, he just needs to know you love him. And uh, so to answer your question, at first I did drive him into some, um, you know, martial arts and things like that, like right. Taekwondo, because I grew up a very afraid kid. Like I was afraid of everything. That's why I built this armor and I didn't want him to be afraid. So I was deflecting my insecurities on him. I'm like, I don't want, you know, like picked on whatever it is as a kid. Um, I'm like, I don't want him to live that. I want him to be confident. I want him to be happy. I want him to be secure um, and not be afraid. So yeah, I, I drove him into, like I said, Taekwondo and a bunch of other things and um, he didn't like it. But right. I made him keep him like until you until you get your red belt or something, yeah. you gotta keep going, right? And I was like, Okay, now so I just let him go. And I'm like, You don't yeah. want to go, you don't want to go. I mean, maybe he'll come back to it, right? But uh, but yeah, I definitely did put some of my insecurities on my kids. Yeah, you know, we all have our own story in, in those ways and when it comes to stuff like that, it's like uh I think about that with, with my kids and stuff and you think, you know, is my kid gonna be able to protect himself like in a fight or whatever? But it, really ultimately it's just up to them. You know, like, uh, I do think as a parent, it is important that you, um, like sports, sports are, are cool. Like I, I played sports as a kid. I loved them and I, I really value the lessons that I learned from sports. Yeah. Um, but not everybody needs all these different things. And, you know, like my son doesn't need to like take like boxing class or jujitsu to be able to defend himself only if he wants to figure out how to defend himself. Right. Um, you know, maybe he does get into a fight one day and maybe he gets his ass kicked and maybe he's like, shit, man, I better like learn how to defend myself. And yeah, he comes I, I that realization. Every boy needs to get punched in the mouth at some point. Yeah. <laughs> you happens. come to the realization yeah. uh, on your own. I mean, you know, um, with the influence of my two older brothers, uh, you know, I came to the realization that like this was going to be my life. I was going to end up lifting the rest of my life. I didn't like it at first. They just kept lifting and I kept seeing it over and over again. And it just kind of, sorry. Yeah. Just kind of <laughs> fell into it and messed just, them up, man. <laughs> mess, messed me up forever. But, uh, we all have to come to these conclusions <clears throat> on our own. 
Yeah, absolutely, ultimately, man. <laughs> ultimately, you can't be forced into it. Yeah, because they're going to resent it anyways, right? We got some questions brewing up over there, Andrew. Not too much, but people are interested in any and all poop stories. Oh, hey, oh, there yeah. you go. Bodybuilding poop stories, getting yeah, deep in those, big, yeah. getting deep down in those in the in the squat. <laughs> <laughs> any any massive blowouts from the different diet changes and uh, you know preparations and nervousness of you no. Know? But I'll tell you what, I'm not I'm not even sponsored by this guy. Stop talking about poop stories. You guys should be sponsored sponsored by Squatty Potty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh yeah. I have one. So, have so one. they sent me one, and I was like, um, whatever. So I put it in my house, like put it in like the we spare want a, bedroom. a more advanced version. Of well, it. But let me tell you, it, uh, it's it's funny. I'm not I'm not sponsored by these guys, but if you have two bathrooms and one has a squatty potty, one doesn't, you'll definitively, I believe, do you go definitively go out of your way to use the squatty potty? When yeah, you I want to. Yeah, yeah, I, I want to use it for some reason. And I've read all the research on it too. I don't know if it actually works because I've read the research says like it's kind of you know, but I think it works. I feel like I feel it like it works. Forces out what? that little extra. Yeah. It, 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 yeah, it's supposed little... to kind of make it more more of like a natural poop. Like yeah. you would squat in the woods and you'd be below parallel and you'd you'd <laughs> get all the is, fucking juices. I hear you we're so fat, parallel, Mark. Is this true? <laughs> I think so. We're we're so fat that he wants to build one into his the floor of his yeah. bathroom so that you just so you sit just down squat. and just pushes your feet. I up. want them to work on the, the design. Like you should be able to push a button and then and then it should come up. As I'm you. sure they exist. Oh, it's like man. a mono lift for a yeah. squatty potty. You, should, you yeah. could just squ maybe a cut, cut a hole in the floor right. Right. for it. Yeah. <laughs> but that that it's helped. Yeah, I think it's great. It leads leads that's, to that's uh, the only real poop star I have. First thing that came to mind. What about uh, what about just going to the bathroom in general? It's like, great that they got... sent it to you though. Just <laughs> like they knew he's a bodybuilder, he's gonna need this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like Everybody. all this all the food this guy's been eating over the years. Yeah, yeah. What like uh, you know when you eat six seven times a day? I mean, you're probably going to the bathroom a lot. But then when you get closer to a bodybuilding show, is it hard to you don't have a lot of calories? Do you not shit for a week or? What? How, it, it, de that it definitely changes the consistency, man. So, <laughs> no, I mean, all kidding aside, like when you get close to the contest, your fiber is very low, right? Because you're not actually taking the the insol or the soluble fiber, right? Like the carbohydrate type fiber. Right. So I'm still eating vegetables, which is insoluble, but um, the soluble fiber that creates kind of the bulk goes away. So you end up having the little deer dropping, little you know, the ra reindeer <laughs> poops, little little pellets. Yeah. So when somebody comes to you now, I know that you teach. Uh, you have got these seminars and camps and all these different things. Mm -hmm. Somebody comes to you and they want to be fucking jacked. You know, they're they're two hundred pounds and they want to be two fifty, two seventy, mm -hmm. two eight, whatever it is. Um, obviously, it's going to depend on a lot of factors. But mm -hmm. typically, what style of diet do you put them on? Um, it's going to depend on their training. So it's their, their, their diet is going to change almost weekly or biweekly, depending on the type of stimulus that I'm subjecting their body to. So everybody starts, you know, I believe to, to build muscle, the mo first and most important thing is creating stability. So if you don't have a stable platform to contract, you can't build muscle. So I put them through a four to six week primer phase, which is basically teaching their body one movements for themselves and two, how to be stable in all these positions that you know they're going to need to get into so if you want big legs you can't create big legs without without a really stable pelvis so let's do some stuff to create stable pelvis and that just means maybe squatting but spending time in the ranges where you're typically weak that's usually when you take the guys into the posing room right exactly <laughs> the, the coldest in posing room <laughs> now let's talk about that. um yeah so creating st creating stability so we'll start there and then from there you know if you're subjecting your body to a strength stimulus you're gonna need a different type of uh, diet. If you're subjecting mm -hmm. your body to a hypertrophy stimulus, you need a different type of diet. You know, strength-based stimulus. You guys know it doesn't require a tremendous amount of carbohydrate. Like you're right. not really depleting your body all that much. Right. So we don't need a tremendous amount of carbohydrate. Whereas hypertrophy-based, you know, a little more volume. I'm going to use more nutrients and use more carbohydrate. Whereas a metabolic stimulus would need something completely different. So uh, it's always very, very dependent. Um, right. But it would definitely be a carbohydrate, depending on somebody's body composition, right? If they're fat, they're not going to get a lot of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. but um, typically, they're going to get a high carbohydrate diet, probably middle, medium to high protein, and, and a moderate fat. So, um, I'm, I'm an advocate of carbohydrates. I just time them specifically, yeah. right? I'm, I'm a what of range of uh, protein usually for somebody who's trying to gain some muscle? Minimum is a gram per pound. I truthfully believe you need a high amount of protein and probably up around 1.5 grams per pound. And then, c would carbs follow suit? About carbs the same, yeah, depending start, on the for depending most on people. Person. Assuming you're under 12 percent body fat, I'm going to start you at about a gram per pound. Um, and then if somebody's leaner, I could go a little higher. Ideally, we want to push it up a kind of as high as we can, you know, like. I find uh, that to be really interesting. I, I find that to be fascinating is like uh, this idea of um, 
Stan Efferding does this a lot, you know, because he train he's working with some mutants now. Yeah. He's working with. I, uh, I want to see their diets. He's working with Thor, and yeah. he's working, and he's Brian, working with Brian, Brian. Shaw. Yeah. And these are guys that are, you know, 400 pounds. And he does like what he calls a vertical diet. Um, it's a lot of the same things over and over again. It's a lot of things that uh, are easy to digest. So you can get from one meal to the next, very similar to a bodybuilder. Yeah. Um, you know, part of the reason why bodybuilders uh, eat chicken, I mean, first of all, it's that the calories are part of it. But uh, chicken and rice are going to digest pretty quick because there's not a lot of fat in them. Correct. Right. And so they'll, they'll be able to get from one meal to the next very easily, whereas opposed to uh, if you have a big omelet or something like that, it might be a lot harder to uh, digest yeah. all that shit. We got a problem yeah. going on? Yeah. Blow out? The audio just cut out, but uh, it's back on. Our boy oh. DJ just checked in, David Webb, and he wanted to know, if Ben, if there's anything you can change in your bodybuilding career early on, what would it be, if anything? Training like a dummy. Um, training, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I just attached to training hard, and I think that caused injuries, it caused inflammation, it prevented me from getting leaner, it prevented me from building muscle. Um, so, like I said earlier, man, you know, running harder or running as fast as you can in the wrong direction isn't going to get you where you want to go. So, um, learning how to do things for my body earlier would have saved me so many injuries and so much problem and uh, so many weak body parts and heartache ultimately, man. So. That's that's massive, and you know Chris and I were talking about earlier. Like, stress more is not always is usually not the best solution, right? It's not just mm -hmm. about more and more and more. It's it's about subjecting your body to a novel stimulus. You need to change the type of stimulus because your body is designed to respond to a novel stimulus. So, um, that would be the thing, man. Is learning how to vary the stimulus, learning how to train for my body rather than attaching to what everyone else does. Awesome, and then some other person whose name I absolutely cannot pronounce. Uh, they want to know if uh, combining bodybuilding and powerlifting for a natural bodybuilder is beneficial. Absolutely. Uh, if they're asking me, I'm asking you, but absolutely. So there, there's, a, there's a massive strength component in, in bodybuilding, right? And the idea behind strength training as it applies to a bodybuilder is to increase the efficiency with which you contract muscles. So if I'm training my pecs, you know, most some of you guys will attach to the idea if you have a weak body part when you when you contract it, it's usually a fluttery contraction. It's not usually a really hard, in, intense contraction. So the objective then should be to increase the efficiency with which we contract muscles. So if you contract now, maybe using thirty percent of your muscle, we want to get towards forty and fifty and sixty. So <clears throat> strength training is going to be the best way to improve that. It's going to improve your nervous system's ability to contract more muscles at one time. So provided your execution is great. We want to just uh, incorporate that strength training to improve the efficiency with which we contract, and then when we're contract, then when we're contracting more percent, a greater percentage of muscle fibers, now the hypertrophy workout is more beneficial because every every single rep I contract, I'm actually using more muscle every time I contract. So you kind of want to cycle through strength and hypertrophy phases. So we're constantly trying to push that that um, nervous system's ability to contract muscle higher and higher and higher, so we can ultimately use as much as many muscles as we can. Oh yeah, thanks, dude. Yeah, being able to push more weight is going to help with muscle growth. Absolutely. Right. Well, I, I don't even attach to that. Like, I, I don't like that because people hear weight, they, they assume putting more weight on the bar means mm -hmm. more muscle. But I was like, no, learning how to contract muscles harder. Right. Or, or more muscle at one time, more right. muscle fibers in one muscle at a time. Have you done any powerlifting? I started as a powerlifter, man. So um, from the time I was 17 to 21, I trained three times a week. It was just squat. Mm. I usually squatted twice a week or I, one week I'd squat twice, one week I'd deadlift twice. And then one week I do kind of upper body. I think we saw a video earlier. You were squatting about six plates. Is that right? Or uh, five or five plates? No, there, there's some videos out there of me doing seven. Hey, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So, I mean, I was 21. <laughs> I, I squatted 750. I deadlifted 750. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, I was a strong kid at those two lifts, but yeah, I think press, I was you know, and I think this is a, a, dumbbells. a cool topic. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, you know, bodybuilding, bodybuilding can be used for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, kind of what we're talking about with diet. Why not switch up your diet here and there? Why not uh, be a proponent of everything? Why not try you know a lot of different uh, methods and techniques? Um, why not Bruce Lee it a little bit? Why not utilize things that work and and uh, let's not get dogmatic and think that only one think that only one thing works i think there's, when it comes to that's uh, a pretty poor one but there's some better ones out there. yeah what kind of weight is that right there uh, six maybe yeah um, but a lot of bodybuilders are strong as fuck and a lot of times you know i, I think the myth has been dispelled i think um uh, some some of the uh, more recent bodybuilders have kind of put a lot of that to rest uh but a lot of power lifters they just power lift all the time mm -hmm. 
And you're like, dude, you're just doing the same thing all the time. Right. You're just going to do ones and threes. Know, like, you're never going to do a set of eight. hate on bodybuilding, too. Yeah, like, you're ah. never going to do a set of 12 or the hate on CrossFit. And it's like, man, yeah. if you were healthier, you'd be fucking stronger. Right. If you were able to do uh, four sets of eight reps in a condensed period of time, you'd be stronger. You know, yeah, rather than you always focusing on these uh, sets of three. they'll get mad and they'll blow off people because they did reps. There you go, Mark. You can think I'm less of a vagina. Look at this guy. I think I actually get to the bottom on this one. I hurt my knee on this one, too, though. Of course, you're a bodybuilder. You're going to get injured doing anything. <laughs> the weights flop around at the top. That's the fucking morning. insane, man. And uh, at that uh, stage, uh, what are you, 270, 280 right there? No, I'm probably about 300, maybe 290. Just like no big deal. Like I You always it. stayed pretty lean in your bodybuilding career. Right, I mean, I mean, you, I mean, I have a lot of credit, man. I mean, I mean, for yourself, you probably would feel, you know, quote unquote, fat, right? right. Because you're so critical. I but. think in 2000, after the 2013 Arnold Classic, I was trying to grow. I think I went up to 318 was the heaviest I got. Holy shit! Um, and that was probably pretty. That was probably pretty. I mean, like you said, it's, I, I don't remember to be honest. I probably didn't yeah. take any pictures. But yeah. I was, What's your body fat if, out around now? Where you uh, at? I don't know, man, but I'm fat. You don't look fat. I'm, I'm, I mean, relative to me, like for the you last look handsome as fuck. Yeah, oh, you look great. Trying to get piece of ass. <laughs> so, I, you know, for the last two years, I walked around under certainly under ten percent, probably close to eight. But because my training volume has gone down so much lately, I've definitely started to accumulate more fat. And I find for me, fasting is the worst thing I can do. Yeah, I don't know if you guys fast, but like I get leaner when I fast. But um, when I eat again, I eat like. You know, I haven't eaten in three months. You have that hyper eating when you <laughs> go back to it. Yeah, yeah some I, people do. Yeah, so and I, but for me, it's like because I, you know, the only thing I really eat that I overeat on is nuts. So I'll eat Mark's nuts, <laughs> um, nut butter, nuts. Um, yeah. So I guess you end up getting really two thousand calories. It's a really easy oh, thing shit. to just crush, like you know. Yeah. A lot of a lot of the nuts and seeds, and then. You know. Peanut butter, man. Fuck. Oh, jar at a time, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not done. Now they make all the flavored peanut butter. I just butter, don't so buy it. Worse. I don't buy it anymore. I just don't yeah, buy stay peanut butter anymore. From I'll, my, I'll kill it. My kids eat it. I love it. So, my kids eat it, so it's always in the house. But when I was dieting, I was like, my, I said to my wife, I'm like, that's not allowed in the house. Yeah. I even smell it. I'm like, no. Yeah, because you eat the whole damn thing. Yeah, because it's you know it's just one tablespoon that's like, you know, like this. And it's yeah, all why is that, that even we, in yeah. bodybuilding diets? It's like a cruel trick. It's, it's like, like yeah, the fat that we don't want. Tablespoon, right? right. make a six exactly. fat. And that's the thing most people don't get it. They think, oh, it's, it's a healthy fat. It's not a healthy fat. Yeah, it's not really. No, it's not at all. Is there but such a thing as a healthy fat? I believe so. Yeah, I believe avocado is great for you. I believe mm -hmm. omega threes are great for you. Um, you know, I just eat a ton of olive oil because there's more information coming out all the time that saturated fat's not necessarily bad. Bad, right? No. Uh, it, it's it's said to be relatively dormant until it's combined with carbohydrates, and that that's the problem in the American diet. Is, right? yeah. What do we eat for breakfast? Is bacon and pancakes, right? Yeah, we right. smash it together, and then that's the problem. Yeah, and that's when it becomes a problem. I don't think either one of them is necessarily a problem by themselves. Sure, like eating exactly. apart, you know. And I love that you brought that up because that's actually the, usually how I design a diet. Is I will never usually combine a high fat meal with a high carbohydrate meal. So this is one of the things Dr. Baker talked about a lot, yeah. the carnivore diet guy. Um, he was basically saying, you know, when it comes to things like vitamin C and it comes to these uh, minerals mm -hmm. and stuff, he said, well, you know, a lot of times people do need those minerals because their diet, uh, because they're sick because their diet is uh is Poor. not is, is not yeah it's not fitting the needs and he says like in the presence of carbohydrates sometimes you need more of these vitamins and there's actually C. been a little bit yeah. of a little bit of research that actually backs up some of the stuff that he's saying and you know who knows maybe he's onto something maybe he's maybe he's way off too mm -hmm. right uh it's all just kind of um you know kind of up in the air for now but it is interesting and the other thing that he said is that uh pe when people are obese uh that they're malnourished which is fascinating because yep. you're like oh my god i never even really thought about that but yeah they are a lot of times a lot of times their vitamin d is way off and this is way off right. and that's way off this cascade of problems have happened um even though they have an abundance of caloric intake yeah because they're eating the wrong foods they're eating empty, <laughs> calorie empty dense but, right. but nutrient uh depleted so yeah, absolutely the truth, man. I mean, uh, like we say, I, I think it's always um, paying attention to allowing it to go through cycles. And I, I like, you know, thinking about the biochemistry of what would happen in a, if you just ate a carnivore diet, your body would become really good at using that, that meat, would become right. really good at using that fat. But maybe at some point it's like, oh, I'm going to be missing something. And, and then, you know, the, the idea of mixing in more carbohydrates may not become the best thing because your body right. has become so adapted to using these fats and meats. It's now right. not used to using carbohydrate. 
man, who ultimately is just <laughs> yeah. figure out what works for you, right? Yeah. Right. Well, it does. It does appear that it, there's uh, there's really just n- no reason to completely swing one way or the other for for too long. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, right. it, it appears that uh, you know, the answer kind of always lies down the middle. Yep. And we, you know, it seems like uh, that pops up all the time, and we're like, oh yeah, yeah that makes the most sense. <laughs> And for some reason, we don't see well, it. Well, because people mindlessly just want to attach to something. And, right. they, you know, everybody wants to tell you they're vegan. Everybody wants to tell you yeah. they're whatever. They're, they, yeah. they want to, I do CrossFit. Like, well, just do what's best for you ultimately, right? And, and uh, yeah, changing it all the time. And eat healthy foods, man. Eat, eat what comes from the earth. Your body will figure it out. If you didn't eat shit from a box, you're going to be healthy. I think that, that might be the simplest yeah. thing. It's yeah. like, eat. That's the easiest foods. rule. Do that's like food. the number one. I think it's like the one rule right. people can actually agree on. Right. But everybody still eats everything from a box. And we're faced day. with so much marketing, right? We're, we're, we're bombarded with this nutrition industry. 600,000 uh, food products on the market. That's it's crazy. Absolutely bananas. I mean, how do you decide what what the hell to eat? Right. You and know? then you're getting so much marketing from, you know, the milk board and like, mm-hmm. like all this shit is just... Just and everything's man. slanted against each other. So, like, if it's like yeah. the milk is against the grain and the grain's against the milk and the right. wheat's against the, you know meat whatever so it's like right everybody's fighting you and, know, then, you know. and then there's the consideration you bring up wheat there's you know people are like oh that's from the ground why don't you eat that and there's the consideration of glyphosate right which yeah it just adds a whole different dimension to everything well right? there's a great documentary uh what's with wheat have yeah. you seen that no joe rogan talks about it a lot but um it's a netflix documentary so most people have access to it yeah but it's a great thing for most people to watch because it'll tell you all the problems that come just from the modern version of wheat that we have. Yeah. Not that it's necessarily such a bad thing, but they tell you like, look, it wasn't that bad, but now it kind of is. And here's all the reasons why. Right. Gives you a lot of information to move forward with your diet. And you could argue that all the vegetables are probably being exposed to that amount of glyphosate. And glyphosate mm-hmm. we know is destroying our bodies. Yeah, right? absolutely. It's destroying our mitochondria, it's killing the bacteria. So that's ultimately what it does, right? I think people are a lot sicker than we even think. You oh, know, I think, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, people are, villi- are viewing uh, these illnesses and diseases as uh, only being a thing when you have them. Right. Um, but there's a lot of people that are suffering from anxiety, depression, ADHD. I mean, uh, there's all kinds of complications that are right. happening to people. I, I used to kind of sit there and think and say, oh, well, you know, it takes 10, 20, 30 for you to kill yourself slowly with food. But now I'm starting to think that that's not even that's not even close to being true. I think you can kill yourself a lot faster with it. I wonder, you know, thinking about the, the neurochemistry of it, serotonin and melatonin are most pre- predominantly produced in your gut produced by bacteria so if or or at least in your gut the gut's called the first brain by some people right so people's guts are so destroyed they're not producing serotonin which is going to be that thing that allows your brain to be calm you know melatonin is going to be that thing that that allows your brain to sleep and we know it's it's going to prevent cancer um so people who are being exposed to all these environmental toxins like glyphosate like pharmaceuticals it's literally destroying your gut and inhibiting your brain's ability to produce serotonin and melatonin therefore causing you know depression causing anxiety causing all these things and there's there's a direct downstream correlation making it harder there to is deal such with a huge uh, stress, problem which you mentioned earlier yeah. right it's such a huge problem in this country with uh, mental health and i think a lot of people do not realize at all that it starts in the gut yeah tell like, them what you said earlier about uh you know somebody losing 10 pounds that comes up to us what do you just uh, how fired up they are you know oh yeah people are just like so excited to tell you that they've that they've done something that they've been you know they're part of what you're they lost 10 pounds 15 you're doing. pounds and what we recognize they want to tell everybody it's not so much about the you know it's not just the weight loss it's it's uh they're they were probably depressed before they're probably just maybe yeah. maybe not even like really like clinically depressed but maybe just in a fucking slump right they just weren't feeling great about themselves they lost this 10 pounds they lost this 15 pounds they accomplished something and now they feel fucking awesome right. and, and so i mean most you get of the time that's the from shows too. making better choices of food right so when you make better choices of food your mental clarity is something that like almost instantly changes you know like the if you yep. get rid of sugar Getting rid of the brain fog and all the other stuff that people talk right. about, it's pretty easy, you know? Yeah, I think it all ties back to that to the brain chemistry, right? The neurotransmitters, man. We're all chasing dopamine. Sugar is going to give us dopamine. You know, Instagram's giving us dopamine. We're all chasing dopamine. You become addicted to it when you don't get, get it. likes, baby. Yeah, when you don't get it, you become depressed. You know, so people are just constantly chasing that. And then eventually, that's the problem with kids, right? You get exposed to Instagram at seven years old now. Every, every seven-year-old kid has a cell phone. 
Yeah, exposed to so much sugar by the time children you hit, have phones. No, man, never. <laughs> I told them when they can pay for themselves, they can have it. Um, yeah, then they hit you know teenage years, and then they, the sugar's not doing it for them anymore. Then they hit drugs, and people are so ad addicted to this dopamine thing that uh, it's an uphill battle that nobody can win. You know, yeah. so learning to remove the dopamine hits, from learning to remove the sugar, the Instagram, the social media, the whatever is the drugs, is the first step I think in like starting to pay attention to your own mental health. Like taking control of it. Is it going to be hard? Absolutely, it's going to be hard because your brain literally chemically is addicted to this stuff. Like you need it. Sure. But like any drug addict, you have to go through a period of withdrawal. It's going to be tough. You have to find some support network. But um, then, hey, now I'm in a little more in control. I don't need these things externally anymore. Mm -hmm. No, you know, I think that's a huge step. You keep mentioning the same word over and over again. You probably said it four or five times, and that, that's control. Having control. Mm -hmm. And I, for, for he and I, the... Uh, the war on carbs, ketogenic style diet, even this carnivore diet has allowed us to have control. And that's why we're so fired up and excited about it. Um, I, I do realize there's a lot of other options when it comes to nutrition. Like we're, we know that. Yeah, if I was we able- We know there's a lot of other choices, but this yeah. gives us really good control over what we're doing to the point where uh, we're not even really uh, enticed or thrown off by a protein bar, a protein shake. I mean, we'll still have them here and there. They're still part of some stuff, but um, that to us is almost like our cheat now. Yeah, exactly. You know, whereas yeah. before we'd have a whole cheat weekend. Right. It'd be like a fucking cheat marathon where we'd be getting uh, peanut butter cups and ordering pizza and doing all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. and so it's, I also it's think given that was us our a major, lot of control. Our major issue was control. Like if we had, and we didn't understand that. If we had the control that you had as a bodybuilder, we could probably eat carbohydrates and be fine. Like you know, what I mean, we we were just gluttons. You know, yeah. it's like when we would eat carbs, we'd eat the whole box of cereal. Right. That's just like once it's open, it's gone. Well, even our choice of carbs. Open you know? box is empty box. You know. Right. Yeah. So we would always choose the wrong things choose things that were laden with sugar with and that's the problem with vegetable with oils depriving yourself of anything and that's that's what i believe is the biggest problem in the fitness industry is you get this, particularly women is they do a contest and and they change their relationship with food now food becomes a reward mechanism so after the contest i'm going to reward myself and how much do we see of that on instagram with the women with the donuts donuts <laughs> right the power right? lifting yeah. and, the, and the donuts the worst thing you and i know they're having i know they're having fun you know i i, I get it it's, yeah, but it's, you're, it's, you're literally yeah. destroying your, your relationship with food yeah. man i yeah. just try to dissuade all people from competing particularly women who, who like I don't, if you're going to compete it's not about the, the competition it's about changing your life because if you, if you create food as a reward mechanism, you're destroyed for the rest of your life. You're going to yeah. fight an up a battle with food forever. And you guys are probably living that. Well, and, and I think like, our original version of the ketogenic diet was um, eating no carbs all week and then on the weekend eating whatever we wanted to. Mm -hmm. And that's just disaster waiting, you know, waiting to happen, basically, yeah. because you're just taking in these giant sugar and fat bombs on the weekends. Inflammation, man. You're causing so much inflammation. Yeah. And, then and as much good as you're doing apart. in like the couple days that you're in ketosis, you only actually get into ketosis for like a day because you're actually minimizing all the damage well, from right. the cheat yeah. meal and the rest would, of the week. We would lose weight, you know, utilizing some of those techniques and methods. And then we, you know, switched over to having one day a week. And then we made it like a meal or two where we cheated. But, you know, we, again, we just didn't understand that the main problem uh, was control. And that's, well, and the problem is know, with that too, is like allowing yourself that one day will turn right back into seven days pretty quickly. Right. You know, right. it's like one day, oh, I'll do two days. Ah, oh, we did the weekend. Let's do a three day weekend, you know? And then, yeah, I mean, if, if you're talking we, the general yeah. population of people to the thing that they're, you guys have control, but the thing they're missing is just not even paying attention, right? That That's step one. It's yeah, like you yeah, gotta pay yeah. attention. You guys have that. Cause, and maybe that's the benefit of the ketogenic diet is it makes you pay attention for most people, for right. the general pop, like just pay attention. And that's what the carnivore <laughs> yeah. diet did to me more was um, I was on a ketogenic diet and I kept swaying. I kept going, you know, because it really isn't about like, so much the fat and the protein it's about like um not eating carbs is what it's really about like right. when you really boil it down to like why it works is like you're not eating carbs so you find carbs slowly creeping back into your diet and that's where like a a tool like the carnivore diet it's like okay go back to zero now yeah. i'm back to zero carbs you know for at least a while and that's that's sort of what helped me it's like another control mechanism mm-hmm you know yes yeah, and i mean it's important to, to have that discipline how has uh w was becoming a professional bodybuilder uh everything that you thought it would be yeah man 
uh, I think it was because it you, know, you were really striving for it when you were yeah, young. Yeah, I mean, I was a kid and I wanted to do it. And you know, walking on that stage at Olympia for the first time was everything that I thought it was going to be. Um, I, I think it, for me, I, I've, I've been able to leverage it and create a platform that allowed me to help other people and not hopefully um, not have to live the same uh, troubles that I did as a bodybuilder. Because mm -hmm. obviously, I made a lot of mistakes, man. So you know, I kind of use it as a le as a leverage or as a platform to take what I learned and help other people, man. So, you know, for me, it was definitely a stepping stone. It was a great uh, journey. I loved it. Uh, some days I still miss it. Some days mm. I still want to get back up there, but I just don't want to put my body or my family through what I, <laughs> yeah. what I went through. How hard was it on your family? Well, like, man, my wife is amazing, so supportive. Um, it just crushes you socially, right? I mean, you can't, like... I don't do it. The thing that killed me... You and the, the wife can't go out with friends type of deal. Yeah, the reason, the reason I stopped was even... You know, because now I'm, I'm still busy. Like, I'm still working just as much. I probably see them just as much. But when I'm with them now, I'm with them. Hmm. Whereas before, you know, you train twice a day. You're up at four in the morning to do your cardio or whatever. Uh, you're just thinking about getting back to your next workout. <laughs> well, yeah. Or, or at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're tired, man. Like, yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't, didn't have energy to, to play with them and get on the, getting on the ground was hard. You know, I'm like, I got to get on the ground and like play with these guys, right? <laughs> yeah. You yeah. get it, man. Yeah, you're all sore. You're like, oh. Yeah. Like, oh, I just did legs. I'm laying, yeah, the only time I'm laying on the ground is if I'm like, I'm out, right? Like, yeah, because you're not going to get back up. <laughs> right. Yeah. And that's the other reason why I'm so focused on getting weight off is because I want to be able to do things with my kids when they're high school, when they're in high school, you know? Yeah. I think that's important, right? Be able to move a little uh, bit. Yeah. I was the man in high school and my kids need to know like I'm still going to be the man when they're in high school, yeah. right? That's the idea. <laughs> yeah. How has your uh, personal growth uh, changed, you know, uh, after retiring from bodybuilding? Because, you know, when you're in the sport and you're focused in on being competitive and focused on being uh, the top dog and being the best that you possibly can be, it, it consumes a lot of your mental sure. reserve and you can't really, uh, it, it, it almost in some ways makes you stupid because you can't really, you can't focus in on anything else. Dude, it doesn't almost, it absolutely does. Well, I mean, you're so, imagine how much food you're consuming. So your body's always digesting food. So you're always tired. People don't think about that. Like you're eating a lot, you must have energy. Just walking around big and it's, dumb. It's the complete, <laughs> right. It's absolutely true. And you know, when you sit down to read a book, what happens? Asleep, right you get it so now i mean just the idea of not having to eat and not having to be on a schedule my, my it feels like it's it's freedom right i can yeah. i can read i can work i can go for six eight hours ten i mean i sit down and write for 10 hours straight and i won't even look up short of having some water uh, and it's just it's such a great liberating feeling and it allows you to go so much deeper whereas before it was all superficial growth mm -hmm. now i'm like man i'm reading whole books and you know, sometimes I'm reading two books a week uh, just like just knocking them out because I, I'm I'm able and I'm not so attached to like every two hours I got to eat. Imagine how much how consuming that is to time, right? Yeah. Like you're prepping your meals, you're eating your meals. Like that's three quarters of it your day. Could be a half right hour there. to cook it. Could be 15, 20 minutes to eat it, and right. it could be another half an hour, an hour sometimes to digest it. Right. You, you do, do seem to do a ton of uh, research, reading. Uh, you have great guests on your podcast. Thanks, man. What are some of the um, awesome books you've read? A couple of them that you can remember. Well, like that you'd the, recommend other like people. The to one read. I just said, um, if you're interested, in, I, I really believe that there's two things that are governing everything, and that's the gut. Um, so there's a couple of good books on the gut. There's Brain Maker, which is David Perlmutter. Yeah, that's a great awesome, book. I great really book. like that. Yep, yeah, there's one called The Good Gut as yeah, well. Yeah, you were talking about book. that. One. The Good Gut. I have yep. that. Yeah, that's a good book. Um, and then as far as the brain goes, um, I just finished one called Buddhist Brain, and just getting into the neurochemistry of of understanding what's actually happening. Uh, in all these different brain states we're in and how we create, you know, like I said, walking into a room, you're creating this this neurochemical signature that either allows you to be really, really happy and elevated or allows you to be really down and depressed or anywhere in between. And you can you can create that and you could stage that so that every time you walk into any situation, I'm there, I'm right on, I'm flipped on, and, and or I'm conversely, I'm depressed and so the shoulders are slumped and you get to choose. Yeah. Does it take practice? Of course, like anything, you can't just do it you know, the first time, but practice, I mean, you can create that peak state anywhere. And I recommend a lot of people uh, audio books too, because I listen to them all the time. We go on our 10 minute walks. Yeah. Like all I do now is uh, I buy a book a week, you know, and mm -hmm. I'll just listen to it because I'm late, too lazy to read it usually. I mean, see, I, I learn more when I read, but like you, time. Yeah, we, we all suck in things differently everything. too, yeah. right? We take we take in the information differently too. So like mm -hmm. when I hear it, I'll remember it. When I read it, I sometimes don't remember it, you know? Right, so. yes, yeah, so I'm the opposite. So the, the couple of the books, man, that you'll love is Joe Dispenza. If you've never heard Joe Dispenza stuff, um, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself is a awesome book and he's got five or six books that are really great title uh first time i heard it i was like it's a life-changing book 
and then uh, David Hawkins. So uh, David Hawkins wrote Power Versus Force, and he's also got a book called Letting Go, both of which are uh, absolute essential books for literally for anybody. So Power Versus Force, that sounds pretty cool. Right, exactly. What is that? Like uh, it's based to... on his um, research that he's actually been able to um, quantify the states of people's um, existence, basically. So um, everybody kind of lives at a different level. So, you know, if you're living at a level of force, it's a very low level of um, conscious awareness. And then you may you may elevate to a level of love or joy or ultimate power it's really it means it's basically so it gives you kind of a framework for allowing you to identify where other people are in their life and giving you a framework to understand how you fit into that context interesting. very very interesting stuff man it sounds weird Med didn't do a good job explaining it but it's uh awesome somebody awesome. uh once said that um you know if they had 10 years to live uh they'd spend nine years studying and researching preparing for the last you know, I think that's so that's pretty brilliant. Man. Yeah, it's an interesting yeah. Yeah. it's an interesting quote. It sounds like, uh, you know, you're you're really doing your doing your homework. What do you think you're in search of? That's a great question, man. I love I love that. Um, so the, here's the irony of my life. What you um, looking for, man? Yeah, we're all looking for something, right? <laughs> um, yeah, brilliant question, and I've I've posed that so that to myself a lot lately. Um, so here's the irony of my life. When I was a kid, I was. Um, fat so i became a professional bodybuilder um i had that's a, very opposite right <laughs> I had, well i had a learning disability so now i become an educator and a speech impediment so now i talk I'm a, I'm a motivational speaker <laughs> so uh now yeah now I, I don't know i don't know what it is man um but um i honestly don't know but i i, I am <laughs> this is the irony of it is I, I just like to learn everything i can about um for me it's about the mental game it's mm. about understanding why we act the way we do um, and how I can improve my life, how I can improve other people's lives. But I love that you asked that question. When you look back at your bodybuilding career, you're sometimes surprised at what you're able to do. Um, you know, not like you're marveling at like the size of your legs or anything like that in particular, but uh, are you, you, you kind of marveling at, uh, you know, where you were able to put yourself? No, that maybe the only thing that I've ever done in my life is, you know, my nickname growing up was Seek and Destroy. Like, if, if I say I'm going to do <laughs> That's it, a good nickname. if I do it, I'm That's gonna, awesome. if I say I'm going to do it. That's got to be the name of your book. Yeah, there you go. Seek and Destroy Pekulski. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I say I'm going to do it, I oh, get it great. done. Here he comes, Seek and Destroy. That's a great, <laughs> That's a great on his song, fucking too. bike yeah, going down the street. Exactly. Pink basket in the front. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. So that, that's always my thing is um, I don't I don't look back and kind of marvel at it. I'm like... It sounds arrogant, but it's almost an inevitability. So if I set my mind to something, I know that I'm going to do it. And I think that maybe is my character trait that um, I'm most attached to as being something that's great, right? It's right. like, if you say it, you, you always do it. And, uh, that, you know, maybe maybe that's something to be learned for people out there. It's just that follow through. Yeah. With all this uh, research and, and you, uh, you know, lo no longer uh, like being angry, lifting angry type thing, what have you learned about people? You know, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of interesting people in the uh, fitness <laughs> industry. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you've spent many uh, times in your life, just like myself, just like my brother, just fucking absolutely hating somebody, you know, just being like that motherfucker, da 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 you know. Oh, what do you do now when uh, you're faced with some of these things? Yeah, and do great questions. Um, so I realized that, uh, f first of all, I always thought everyone else was like me, and I've learned that's not the truth. <laughs> um, so I, I used to believe that everyone is inherently good and everyone has great intentions, and I've realized that's not the truth, and that's a very important lesson to learn. Uh, and I also realized that people can't give you anything other than what they have. So don't expect someone to... Uh, don't don't expect anything of people really like you know people get angry at the lady the, the analogy I always use is people get angry at the lady at the grocery store for being slow or I'm like but she's a grocery clerk for a reason she's not a fucking brain surgeon right <laughs> like people are only able to give you what they have so um, trying to see the world through other people's eyes has really changed my perspective so if I'm having a conversation mm -hmm. with you uh, it's always like I'm trying to flip that around rather than wanting you to see the world the way I see it. I'll try to see the world the way you see it and uh, allows me to kind of meet you where you are. And hopefully, um, you know, if need be, we'll try to meet on common ground somewhere. Or I'll right. try to you know try to understand a little bit differently. So my interaction with people has definitely changed a lot. And, um, you know, I've learned to not be emotionally attached. So like you, I'm sure at some point there was a massive emotional attachment to um 
uh, like the way people treated me or, or right. the way the interaction went. Um, but now it's, um, you know, I, I don't get angry about things anymore. I'm much less emotional about it. I'm just, uh, you know, it, it well, is you, what it is. Yeah. And you have your circle, right? You got your wife and your kids and it's like beyond that. It's like, there ain't a whole lot, <laughs> maybe a couple family members. And it's like, we're just, we're going to stay right here and stay in this pocket. And I, I hate that, you know, like uh, gr growing up, I, yeah. I was very, always by myself. So I love the idea of bringing great people into my life. Right? Right. I love the idea of, um, cause there's the synergy of, of great people. Yeah, you don't want to lose hope. You don't want to lose hope in everybody. But, <laughs> but at some point you do. <laughs> it's yeah, well, it's going to be your, if you get sick, you know, uh, it's going to be your wife that's going to be there with you. Those, yeah. those types of things. You right. Know? Yeah. Unfortunately that, but I, like I said, I'm trying not to lose hope, man. I'm trying to create a circle of great people working toward a common mission because I know that great people can do creative things as a, as a group. Together, yeah. Strength in um, numbers, yeah. Yeah. But like you said, uh, and, and I also realized, I guess, extending that conversation that when put under stress, um, people always act uh, in accordance with survival. Mm -hmm. So um, if they're stressed, someone's always going to show their true colors. So I, I'm always aware of that. So I try not to be attached, like I said, to you know, having these great relationships with people because if they're stressed, they're always going to say, you know, two middle fingers to you. I'm going to worry about myself. That's just human nature. <laughs> right. um, so there's very few people in the world that I know would, uh, you know, ultimately lay down right. in traffic. So what about money? What you doing for money? What's your, what's what your work? Doing? Don't ask. Uh, no. So I've got, <laughs> that's the, um, this is where he whips out the G string. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I've got, there you go. So I've got an online business. Um, it's actually shown on the screen right there. So I'm oh, teaching that people. Jacked. I'm teaching people um, exercise execution for their body because I think that to me is the most empowering tool you can give anyone is like, hey man, stop watching what all these other monkeys are doing. Start doing what fits your body. So you stop hurting yourself. There's no more such thing as, as weak body parts. There's no more plateaus because now we just learn how to, to um, distribute tension in our body. So uh, that's effectively what I do, man, is, um, you know, What's I'm the this, guy. Uh, philosophy of forget everything you ever knew. You know, I kind of hear you uh, preaching that. It's almost like a little uh, matrix like deal. I've, well, I've heard forget you what talking. you thought you knew about muscle building, right? So, um, you know, we attached, if I ask you, you know, what do you do for chest? Most people, I do a bench press, I do dumbbells. Mm -hmm. I don't want people to think like that. Like exercise is, um, Damn, that was, that was fucking good. You were fucking insanely jacked when you were <laughs> on stage. Exercise is only a mean, exercise is only necessary or it's only a means of inflicting in, internal response, right? So uh, rather than attaching to well, how much do I lift or how, what exercises do I do, it doesn't matter unless it's creating this internal response. So that's why I want people to stop thinking about exercise and start thinking about, well, how do I challenge a muscle? So if my objective is building a muscle, the only objective I should have is challenging a muscle, right? I'm trying to put as much tension or torque or load through this muscle as possible. Uh, and that just means manipulating the variables of exercise. So um, these, this is all what we're teaching here is people how to do it exactly for your body. So obviously we still use conventional exercises, um, but not being attached to any particular um, mechanism, just being attached to uh, exactly how we're getting it done. This uh, mind-muscle connection and, and this uh, control that you have over, uh, you know, every little detail of your body is remarkable, I think, in a lot of ways. And I think that under normal circumstances, uh, people would never, you know, people got into this uh, mindset of um, uh, sports-specific training, mm -hmm. you know, that you're going to take a, a, a heavier baseball bat and you're going to swing it, or you're going to do, uh, you know, an exercise like a wood chop type movement with a cable uh, because you're trying to swing something, you know, from trying to learn to... Uh, create more torque to swing a baseball bat or whatever it might be. But I think that bodybuilding has uh, a great uh, fundamental approach to it and it has uh, a great foundation in, in building somebody to be stronger and to be able to connect and to be able to coordinate their muscles in a way and organize their muscles in a way uh, that when you're learning how to flex, uh, you know, the lower part of your hamstring or whatever it is that you might ac actually be uh, teaching or coaching somebody, that can have great application to somebody doing a sprint. It can create a have great application to a lot of different things. And I'm not saying that you would specifically only train uh, an athlete, you know, with bodybuilding, but I think that sometimes people think that this uh, effort to build muscle, that it's kind of uh, all show and no go type deal. But a lot of bodybuilders are extremely athletic. And a lot of times building this muscle mass, as we pointed out earlier too, can build up tremendous amounts of strength. Right. 
Well, ultimately, the application for an athlete is resilience, right? If you're a powerlifter, if you're if you're an athlete, um, the reason you'd want to do bodybuilding is because bodybuilding is ultimately about resilience. It's about, yeah. or it should be, at its core, it should be about um, getting strong where you're weak. Uh, you know, addressing your weaknesses first, because the only thing that's ever you're only going to be as strong as weak link. You know that, right? Um, so the way we train is um, literally like trying to. Um, isolate um, all your weaknesses and make you absolutely resilient. You know, Dave Asprey stole my term bulletproof, uh, but that's ultimately what we're trying to do, right? right? Is I want to make you absolutely resilient so that every, you're strong in every single part of the range of motion that a muscle has to go through. Uh, and that's how a muscle will develop. It's, it's not just developing one part that's really, really strong, another part that's really, really weak. I want to make everything absolutely resilient and bulletproof, bulletproof so that one, we're less likely to get injured. You know, you're not going to tear a weird muscle doing something like lifting a grocery bag or something right um and uh, ultimately improve your ability to perform what have you learned about business in the last couple of years everything <laughs> i learned that i didn't know anything and i still don't because you really probably didn't have much uh, of your own personal business going on during no. your bodybuilding career other than some relationships maybe with some sponsorships or something like yeah, that. yeah so in 2011 i found out my girlfriend at the time was pregnant so i started building a business i started in, well actually 2010 i started in 2011 like, mm, i should get some sort of job I should, well <laughs> i had i had income from sponsorships but yeah. you know with sponsorships at any one time if they get pissed off or if you have a bad placing they pull it or so they like, well, get sold or whatever yeah There's right sounds like well, i need to be a man here i need to get a, i need to build a business so it started then um but what have i learned about business well wow, it's endless um do you read books that are specifically about business or i read more business books than i do about the mm -hmm. body now man like i read everything about I'm learning about marketing i'm learning about just leadership i'm learning about you know, organizational strategy i'm learning about finance i'm learning about everything yeah. like, it's kind of constant <laughs> Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the thing that is maybe most important for most people that are trying to start a business, and you know this, is having a very clear mission, having a very clear culture, uh, because without that, uh, what I've run into is is finding uh, employees that are underperforming because they don't have a very clear objective. If everyone's working, um, you know, altruistically toward a mission, then it makes it much easier for, you don't have to micromanage people, you just mm -hmm. lead, and there's a big difference there, right, being a leader yeah. versus a manager. So, um, yeah, learning how to make sure that, that vision is crystal clear, um, and I'm still working on that, but you know, ultimately, um, that's been the biggest takeaway. And then there's a lot about marketing. There's a lot of the, the, you know, the X's and O's of, of learning how to actually execute on the stuff that it's all very new to me. Right. It's all for me, <laughs> yeah. the business has grown organically, you know, just because, Hey, this is a huge jack dude with big muscles. I should listen to him. Um, but now it's, uh, if you want to take it to the next level, you have to learn right. some marketing strategy and the X's and O's. Yeah, with with this business, it's been interesting. Um, I don't like being like a boss or CEO or any of that kind of stuff. Um, when I've left, the more that I leave people alone, it seems like the better off they do. Um, there's going to be people that, uh, you know, occasionally you're going to have to replace people. And I mean, there's certain things, certain decisions you got to make that uh, just fucking suck. You know, there's no other way to put it. It just sucks. Um, but in general, uh, with these guys, with this crew that I have, I'm I'm really lucky and fortunate. Uh, the the less I hover over them, it seems like actually the better the things are. Um, that's one thing that I've learned over the last couple of years is that if I pass something off to somebody, uh, don't be such a dick to think that you know what I just gave to you is going to be worse. Uh, have have the uh, strength to understand that uh, what you just turned over to somebody else can actually turn a whole lot better <laughs> by you giving it to somebody and by you communicating with that person uh, on what your vision is mm -hmm. um, if you're not communicating with that person then they are gonna everything that you ever give them they're gonna make it worse uh, but with these guys you know I'll come in here at 7 in the morning uh, to hit a training session sometimes and they're already in here I'm like what are you doing here they're like oh working um, I'm leaving at 6 or whatever it might be depending on the day and uh, there they are still fucking plugging away I'm like fucking go home what are you doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I get it, man. And communication is something, as you can imagine, as a bodybuilder, I wasn't very good at. And that's probably why I chose bodybuilding, even in my relationships. Like, I guess I was okay with my wife, but um, it just wasn't something I was good at. So I'm learning, man. I'm learning. It's just about transparency. And, and I, really, um, being a great leader, as you know, man, is, is um, finding something to be grateful for in your, in your employees, in your team. Right. Uh, always pointing out the little stuff that sometimes goes unnoticed. And I think that maybe. <laughs> One of the biggest takeaways is, you know, I, I was always one who um, just, if I ask you to do something, I just assume it's going to get done. But 
I don't do that anymore. Like I'm very grateful when it actually does get done, and I make sure I point out when they're doing something well. And I uh, just, I honestly, it sounds sounds crude, but I speak to or I, I I draw similarities between kids and and team members. It's like just like give them give them acknowledgement, man. Let them know they're doing a great job, and they'll always work so much harder. I think that's always important. Tell people they're doing a good job. You know, yeah. it doesn't take, it doesn't cost you anything. Right. And it doesn't. And what an uplifting hurt. feeling it is sometimes. And then if somebody uh, recognizes that you're losing weight, or somebody recognizes that you're, yeah. you're just doing something a little bit better, you're like, oh shit, all right, it's yeah. working. And I never, <laughs> I never wanted that, or never needed it as as an athlete or as, as a kid. So I just didn't do it. Yeah. Or I never, I never Not got everybody's it. like you, Ben. Yeah, God well, damn it! I, I'm, you said I'm earlier. losing that. I'm, I'm learning that stuff now, right? So, yeah, man. Lots of lessons to be learned in business. You know what they say the worst thing about communication is? What's that? Thinking it ever happened. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Yeah, because you're yeah. like, I told... And then you're like... Yeah, and then you I, think, I didn't tell him. Then you think about, about it, it, and you're like, I didn't really tell him exactly. Right. You're like, I mentioned something to him, because I'm the worst at that, just because stuff pops up in my head, and I'm like, da 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 And then I walk away so yeah you know what i started doing now we've got a couple channels to like every time something comes in my brain i just record a voice note and i send it to yeah. somebody and i'm like so i know it's exactly it's there Before you forget it <laughs> yeah and so shaking his head over there yeah i got one last night <laughs> <laughs> yeah i was like i'm doing an ama thing with uh reddit and i'm like no you're doing a photo shoot at the exact same time and i was like you, you don't need both. me yeah i was like you don't need me for the photo shoot and he's like i think you're the main part of it <laughs> turns yeah, out was i fun. was wrong so <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, when it comes to scheduling, I'm always wrong. That's for sure. Yeah, I've just hired somebody to exclusively organize my life because it's getting to the point now where I'm like, like I hate looking at my phone. I don't yeah. want to open my email anymore. I'm like, well, just wake up, send me, give me a piece of paper, and tell me what I'm doing all day, and then I'm happy. It's an important thing is to, uh, you know, as a, as a business owner, is to, you know, hone in on the stuff that you really like doing. Otherwise, what you doing it for? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you got a job, not a business, right? Yeah, and then you're more stressed than you, than you need. Anything else in uh, closing her out here? What, what else have we got going on? We've got uh, where can people find it? Well, that kind I've of got stuff? Uh, I've got camps like we spoke about earlier. I've got one camp a month teaching people to go deep on on mastering their body, and uh, it's literally a life changing experience. How right? do you get involved in the camp? So it's um, all over the internet uh, as far as my websites. And I want to I, I I go to one. Dude, we'll, we'll do some stuff later today, and uh, yeah. you can give me a shout-out if, if you enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's mi40nation.com slash camp. Um, that's one of them. Or you can go to the MI40 gym website. Um, so i got a gym in Tampa, 10,000-square-foot gym. So everyone, Awesome. It's funny, man. We get people from all over the world, people from Australia, people from— How um, long have you had the gym for? Three years. Cool. Um, so we get people from Australia, Europe, South America, uh, like literally everywhere, U obviously U.S. and Canada. Um you know, three days going deep on mastering everything about your body and uh, small groups. So I intentionally keep it to 12 to 15 people so I can give you individual attention. And uh, it's honestly, man, I'm, I'm there giving you all my time and attention mm -hmm. with the intention of changing your life. And I'd imagine you have a few coaches with you as well. Yeah. So all, right. all last year and the year before, I never taught these these camps. I had other guys teaching for me. Uh, but, you know, I actually really like connecting with people, man. So it may not yeah. be the most efficient use of my time, but actually like connecting with people. So mm -hmm. I'll keep doing it for a little while longer until I yeah. can't afford to do it as far as time. No, but if you, uh, if you so like that, doing it, it's important. You know? Yeah. And then I've got a member site where we're, you know, we're really striving to empower men and women with the uh, skill set to take control of their body. And that's ultimately, man, we know your body is your vehicle to living your greatest life without a great body, without excess energy. You can't be creative. You can't be productive. You can't be happy. So yeah. Trying to teach and teach everything that goes into muscle building, not just the X's and O's of like, hey, here's how to train. It's like, hey, here's how to optimize your gut. Here's how to optimize inflammation. Here's how to optimize your brain. Yeah, your mind can't be sound if you're in pain. Yeah. Right. So, the yeah, rest all, of your body's all those on things crutches. are going into the website. So. Fucking awesome, man. Thank you thanks, so much man. for uh, coming out. And, yeah, uh, thanks, man. Thanks, boys. Sharing this experience with us. And um, thanks for fasting this morning. Yeah, I'm very, <laughs> very grateful that I'm here. So thank you so much, man. Big fan of both of you guys. So thank, thank you, man. You. Appreciate it. Where can people find you on the in Instagrams? Um, IFBB Ben Pack. Um, but that's Instagram, Facebook. And uh, YouTube is uh, MI40. Muscle intelligence is what MI40 means. Boom. Booyah. Awesome. Strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Bye. Later. Thanks, man. That was fun. Thanks, man. That's it. It was great. Let's get yeah. some food. Yeah.